let you just start with, and I know we got into it a little bit, but start with where you got into dogs. I think that's a really interesting story, and you don't see a lot of the steps that you've taken to be where you're at in dogs. And I, and I, I'm gen, generally like curious too. So you started off growing up in Yonkers. Growing up in Yonkers, not being allowed to have a dog in my own home. My parents were primarily my mother. Didn't want to know anything. They didn't own their own home. We lived in a, in an apartment on a dead end street. And, uh, every chance I got every stray dog, Every opportunity, including uh, I got a chance to become a dog walker for a local guy who owned a restaurant, and um, he had a Great Dane. And so I used to walk about seven miles each way to get to the dog from where I lived. Holy shit. Yeah. Um, so just You live in the city, you got to walk, especially when you're 10, 11 years old. Um, I got a bike eventually. I didn't always have a bicycle, but yeah. I got a bike, and I used to ride once in a while. But uh, three dollars was the was the rate, and I used to take this great day out in the morning and bring them back five six o'clock at night. <laughs> These were during the summers, uh, school days. I used to get them only for an hour or so, but I grew to love this dog, and that's what started it off. Um, I started collecting strays every once in a while, and it, I lived in a very predominantly Italian neighborhood, and every Italian guy in the neighborhood had a beagle in their backyard. <laughs> and so most of the dogs I started with were beagles. Why, is there a reason? That uh, Italian people like rabbits, and a lot of them hunt. Oh. And they use beagles to hunt. That and makes sense. That's what was there, so that's what I started working with. And uh, it just started off just trying to get them to uh, be friendly and have, a, have someone in their lives, you know. And it they weren't, they weren't pets, though, right, the beagles? They live in the... No, these, I mean, I would keep them in the woods where I lived. Um, I lived on a dead end, and at the end of the road was a, was a section of wooded area. And uh, I could never let my mother know I had a dog. So I used to keep them up there every once in a while. Uh, after I'd come home at night, I'd go back and forth, leave them a couple little things to eat, leave them some water. And then uh, that's really how it started off. Was you, did your parents know that you were... Walking the dogs, though? They knew you were involved? They knew I was the dog walker okay. because I would come back up to my own neighborhood with this. The great day was <laughs> shoulder high to me, you know. Very well behaved, never gave me a hard time, and no one ever messed with me. Sure. He's probably bigger. At 10 years old, he's probably... He was, a big, he was probably about 140 pounds, and he was a harlequin. So oh, cool. he was really different looking. Yeah. He was a harlequin, and uh, good boy. Brutus. That was his name. That was his name. So you went from... So your your parents, are they Italian? Yes. Yeah. Yes. My father was in construction. My mother was a housewife. Cool. And and you in Yonkers, where's where is that in the in the that's not in that's not its own bureau, right? Or City borough. of Yonkers is the is the southernmost part of Westchester County. It's just okay. before the Bronx line. Okay. So I uh I lived there until I was about twenty. But in that time, I mean, I started with, uh, with the dog walking, but then I, I really enjoyed spending the time with the dogs that I was able to cultivate on my own, these dogs that were just walking the neighborhoods, eating out of garbage pails. Mm. And uh, I did that, I mean, till I was about 14. And then my connection with the Great Dane led to some other things. Um, so the guy, the guy that owned the restaurant, was he like a, an Italian guy too? Oh, very much so. Yeah. Very much so. And, and then he, he knew other guys. He knew other guys that he, you know, he was so happy with the job that I did that uh, all of a sudden I was getting calls from other guys that frequented his restaurant. Right. And uh, I said always, I only knew one word and that was yes. <laughs> and so before I knew it, I had a little enterprise going on as a kid. Just with the dogs? Just with the dogs. I mean... To really clarify how my mother refused to allow animals in the house, I, I was given a, a little duck around Easter time once from an uncle, and uh, I snuck it in the house, and my mother took it and put it in our little back porch area. And when I woke up in the morning, he was standing in this little thing of water, the duck, and his feet were frozen into the water. He couldn't move. Oh. So... 
I mean, that's how really strict my mother was. I, I'll say my mother, because my father, he didn't have much to say about it, but my mom just didn't want animals in the house. And so uh, I found other ways to, to get around that. So you had this kind of, so you were walking the dogs, and then you kind of had your own dogs in the woods. And... and then I started growing the dog walking thing. Before it was probably even a thing, right? I mean, oh, it wasn't a thing. Right. We're talking, I mean, I was, uh, we're talking like in the early 60s, mid-60s. No one ever thought of, of the dog industry being what it is today. Right. And so that's how it started. That's interesting. But it, there was always a seed that stuck with me. I mean, even though I got into other things, and as we continue to talk, I might surprise you on how many other things yeah. that, that developed in my life. But the dogs always carried through, even though I did many, many other things. And if you'd like, I'll let you know right now. As a young adult, it started as a floral designer. I'm an award-winning floral designer. Had my own florist shop. Worked in shops in Scarsdale, in Manhattan, in Yonkers. From there, I, I, I enterprised a little bit. I got into the, uh, I had a, I sold the florist. I had a Coke franchise. Coca-Cola? Coca-Cola franchise, where I used to deliver Coke to different places. Like a distributor? Correct. Huh. Uh, after I sold the florist, I bought a Coke route, but it was a little bit too crazy. They had returned bottles, and I said, you got to be crazy to be not only selling them, but then having to take them back. So I sold that. I went into the food business, where I really got a good education in, in meat handling and, and things like that, because I, I bought a coffee route where they would go to different construction jobs in the city of Yonkers. So it's kind of like a paper, paper well, I don't want to say now because now they're gone, but how a paper route was when I was a kid where you'd be responsible of the route and you'd go and deliver for the, for the company, for Coca-Cola, for coffee. They'd be like, hey, here's the stuff, you go. No, the coffee stuff, all the food was prepared, and I would go to different businesses, and as the companies th that I was going to, they would get breaks in the morning, lunch breaks, afternoon breaks, I would be at these different places at certain times when they got their breaks and they would come out, tear the food apart, pay me, and then I'd leave. That was your own thing? That was my own oh, thing. Okay, okay, okay. Yes. So from, I, I built that into, from one route, I built it into a 14-route a uh, commissary where I made my own food. I didn't buy everything made. I started making everything on my own. And then I leased each of these routes out where I would, they would buy all the food from me, go out, sell it, and then have to pay me for the food. So I did that for a number of years. How old were you at that point? I was in my early 20s. And I had, I had married, and I had a daughter at two years old was diagnosed with acute lymphocytic leukemia at two, two and a half years old. And so changed life a little bit. Yeah. But the dog stuff, all, I always dealt with some dogs, maybe only one at a time, sometimes two or three. But then I started, you know, people would say to me, hey, I'm looking for a dog. What do you think I should get? Then I started getting more technical and doing some research on and, and figuring out what the best dog would be. Not necessarily the kind anybody wanted, but somebody came to me and wanted a pet, and they were looking at German Shepherds or working dogs. I would try to turn people away from a working dog if they wanted a pet turn them onto something like a lab that was a little more mild and right. I started matching dogs with people and, and it, it just worked out and all of a sudden before you know it everyone they called me the dog man everyone started talking to me about dogs to a point where and my wife will laugh about it now I go to a wedding I, I say to her I don't want to talk about dogs anymore it's all I talk about yeah. but it was always very deep-seated there was always something about it that that was part of me it felt right and so, to move it along a little quicker, uh, I got into the meat business where I had a uh, boar's head provisions, Thuman provisions routes, all these type of routes. A company called Shaw and Weber, who make these uh, dry sausages and everything. I got into that business, did that for four or five years, but I still would get dogs. There was a place in Yonkers called um, Canine Command Dogs. It was operated, owned and operated by a Tony Millardi, who, uh, who was a son-in-law to this really well-known trainer, Jack Healy, 
who used to be on the back cover, you're going to laugh at me now, the back cover of, of Book of Matches. Jack Healy, okay. School for Dogs, come and learn about dog training and all this stuff. That was advertising back then. It was advertising right. back then. And they used to, it was a big deal. They had a lot of these department stores like Macy's would have dogs dropped off at night, picked up in the morning. And they used to do this at a lot of places in the Bronx. And since I lived right on the Yonkers Bronx line, they used to do, like, uh, if you had a business and you wanted to prevent break-ins, you'd call this company, Yonkers Canine Patrol Dogs, They'd come to your place when you close, drop off a dog, come back 6 o'clock in the morning and pick that dog up. They'd have a truck and a route, and they'd go around. Wow. And again, that word route is big for me because I was a route man. So I, I understood the way it all worked. And so I got into it a little bit that way where I was uh, dropping off dogs, training them how to stay off the fence because I had instances where I, I, I leased dogs to companies and... Somebody wants to get in, they'd take a long pipe or a stick, tie an arrow at the end of it, tape it up, and as the dog leaped up on the gate, they used to stab the dog with this the arrow. arrow. Yeah. So, you know, if somebody wants to get into something, they, they find ways. Then you get into poison proofing because you don't want your dog. People would throw poison hot dogs in, so we started. I used to use a, uh, a, a solar. It was a box that they used for... Uh, electrified fences for cows yeah and i would hook up wires to the both ends of the hot dog and set the dog up so if he went to touch the hot dog he'd get a shock uh, i see these are these are the way i personally developed my own ways there wasn't there was no fancy companies that provided any type of equipment and anything like a ray allen or there was nothing like that so the, and they would that's fascinating that they would they would drop the dogs off at these stores without a handler Without a handler. No. No one can handle it but the guy that drove the truck. That's the point. That's the point. So if anybody... They Including didn't have the owners. Right. So they didn't have security guards or anything like Nothing that. Nothing like that. Ah, that's interesting. And Manhattan, I, I mean, I remember Macy's. They used to drop like five Dobermans off at Macy's. Because at the time, the Doby was the big dog. Wow. Big popular dog. Movies about Dobermans were on television, you know, they bite their own masters, they kill their own masters. <laughs> and so that was the tough dog of the time. But uh, I developed a little company like doing that. And then uh, I, got a, I got an idea to go out to California. I was reading a, a dog magazine. There used to be a, a working dog magazine, um, dog sport magazine. Okay. And it would have advertisements in the back. And there was a company out in California called Mandolin Kennels in Bakersfield, California. And they, would, they were giving trainer courses, three-month trainer courses. And I was bound to go. So mm. one year, my son was born October of 81. And January of 81, I left for Bakersfield, California. My son was three months old. And I had a daughter at the time with uh, acute lymphocytic leukemia. And I have an older daughter. So I go out to California. Did you bring the, the kids? I went by myself. Okay. Kids stayed home with the wife. Okay. And uh, that was really the start of my professional career where I consider it to be the start where I was bound to make dogs my primary income. And what age was that? So Okay, so uh, about 24, 23. So, yeah, I was just trying to timeline from when you went. So it makes sense because you started off with the routes and the kind of like the, the almost the food industry with the meats and making everything to the construction sites before. Before that. Right. And then you got hooked up with like, oh, you know, this company's kind of doing the same thing that I would do with food, but with dogs and a different business. Yep. And then you were like kind of connecting dots. And then a couple of years later, you went out to California to do dog training. To do, do to do what I felt was the beginning of the professional end of it, where I was really determined. But it wasn't about connecting dots. I wish I looked that far in advance. That is just the way the flow took me. Mm, naturally. It, it was a natural flow. And so I spent, uh, I spent th all told about a year out in California, 
came back, hardly recognized my son because he was, he was grown. You know, he was yeah. much different. Did you drive? To I flew to California. And I didn't rent the car when I was out there. I mean, it was a very desolate place. Everywhere you looked was one of those oil rig pumpers. It's Bakersfield, is that Southern California? Right next to the Baja. Yeah, that's Yeah, that's it's Southern thought. California. And at the time, there was nothing there. It was uh, oil rigs and, and that type of uh, lifestyle. And know. what was the, what was the, paint me the dog training scene back then? Did you know anything about it or was it just what you saw in magazines? Just what I saw in magazines and what I had, I, I had uh, been exposed a little by this uh, Yonkers canine company and, and that was run by Tony Millardi. But they would never let you see the, what went on behind closed doors. Like the process? The flanking, I mean, at the time, that's the way they got dogs to bite, primarily flanking and uh, being the agitation part of it. Now, by flanking, in context, that would be them physically grabbing the flanks of the dog to agitate them towards the bad guy, the decoy or the bad guy at the time. Absolutely. And it was just like a dog that had no retrieve drive. We used to do what they called force retrieve. You would pinch the ear to the point where you hold an object, you pinch the ear so that the dog would grab the object to teach him to hold on to that object. I mean, these are the ways I learned. Just like using a throw chain, they called it. You take a regular chain collar, Yeah. you spin it so that it's half the size, but it looks like a little half a hot dog. And it's, it was called a throw chain when the dog was disobedient. If you put a dog in a downstay and you start to walk away and the dog moved, yeah. today they'd lock you up for that. Would you throw it at the dog or would you throw it near? At the dog. Okay. That's the way I was taught. Right. You hit the dog with that. Right. But it worked. So with the, with the force fetch, that was like a very aversive type of negative reinforcement. They would go, hey, this sucks. And they're like, how, how does... How do, I get, how do I get it to stop? And as soon as they grab right. it, it stops. Right. And I admit it's a crazy process, but it's the way things were. There were no computers. That the communication was, you know, a payphone if you could find one. So the only education that you could get on training dogs were in the magazines because the people that were training dogs at that time weren't, weren't really transparent about the process and how they were doing Correct. It. I learned a lot from from a, an army, a military trainer, Bill Keeler. He's got a lot of books out. Some people pronounce it Kohler. He pronounced it Keeler. But between, he's probably right. <laughs> I, I think he would be. Bill Keeler, uh, and he's got a lot of books out. Uh, and, he, and he produced books by step. So you can get a, a basic obedience book. You can get a, a, a book that incorporated some scent work. Mm. Uh, and then once you got real confident, then you get into the bite work. But also Captain Haggerty, big pit bull guy, uh, big, a big bunch of a man. I mean, he was a big, tall guy, and uh, he was very good with pit bulls. And I was in California. He was in California at the time. We hooked up, and uh, all these different steps advanced me a little bit more and, and made me more determined to, to get into it the way, to the magnitude that I wanted to. So that, so that place that you went to in Bakersfield, that was a, a school for dog trainers? It was a school for dog trainers, but it was also a boarding kennel. Uh, they did grooming there. And so when I went there, I, you know, I did a lot of classroom time. And he sold the books. He sold everything you needed. He had every bit of equipment that you could possibly need. But then all his boarding customers would leave their dogs there and while they were there those were the dogs that we worked with to train and it was a it was a good circle as far as he got his customers his boarding customers free training he was being paid by the students to be there and then we would also work on dogs that people came in to have trained so Mm. he had all bases covered he used to do public obedience classes. That's where I got great experience. I would do public obedience classes at night, lights, lighted field, 75 people. You try controlling 75 newbies with dogs yeah. all at the same time in a public obedience class. So 
I started doing it, and he thought I did such a good job, he made me continue. And not much to my liking as far as, you know, the volume. But we used to do an hour and a half, two classes three times a week, an hour and a half uh, for the two. And uh, it just it just kept going. It just kept going. I, then I left Bakersfield, California. While I was there, I had a brother that was a police officer in Westchester County. And I trained his dog. Now, I'm going to show you. This is where the dots were purposely connected. I trained his dog. And as it turned out, later in life, I'll just jump for a second, you know, 35 years later. I was hired as a police officer by one of the, he was just a, uh, he was a police officer, a canine handler at the time. He hired me as a police officer on his department, and I handled the dog for him on his department, and he was a co-worker of my brother's that I trained 30 years prior with a dog. Did, you, did they know? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. And so the way, I mean, he didn't hire me because he knew me. He just, I hadn't, I hadn't seen him in years. I didn't even recognize him, and he said, Wow, I can't even believe it. And so, so you went back to New York, and then you were training dogs back in New, in New York? Well, I went back to New York after California, but then I also went to, uh, uh, I met a guy, called, his name was Hans Müller, and I went to Germany buying some dogs. I wound up making some contacts there and stayed there for a while and attended this police state school. In Germany? For, in Germany for Rottweilers. Learned a little there. I also had to, the opportunity to uh, get hooked up with a guy in Slovakia, where we were going to uh, in the in the, I'm jumping up to the 90s now. We were going around to uh, some of the prisons in Slovakia doing muzzle fighting. I I became a real good helper and started to do a lot of muzzle fighting with dogs. And uh, they used they used dogs with muzzles in the prisons. They used to have these um, wire box muzzles with with little um, pieces of metal coming out, and these dogs would just do a lot of damage without even biting you. So I started doing a lot of muzzle fighting. Um, it opened up it opened up a whole world, the whole dog world to me. Where now I started uh, looking at the big picture, and it started as a way to make money and now it combined I mean I had such a great love for the dogs but it it developed into a way of life for me mm. uh, everything was dogs everything I did and so there wasn't there wasn't the kind of equipment that we have today like I used to get a motorcycle tube Cut it into cut cut the tube in half and then slice it down the middle. Wrap it on my arm and then get an old corn sack, burlap corn sack. Put it over my arm. That's why my tattoos here. My arms are all scarred up. Tat, I, I would I would wrap the burlap on it, and and that's how I take the bites. Sometimes they'd get the, the right spot. Sometimes they wouldn't. Yeah. But this is how it all developed. It's it's really cool because <clears throat> for me. I got into the dog space very organically, similar to you, but it's a completely different field now, like with education, styles, equipment, unfortunate politics, etc. So it's cool because the generation that started working with dogs that you were in, you guys were like frontiering all of this. You were like, okay, I agree. how do we get a dog to not maul a prisoner, but, you know, make them submit, you know, things like that or, or, or doing that. So I just want to get more granular on the process of getting from Ger to Germany. So you did, you did Bakersfield, you came home. Um, I'm assuming you're working dogs back at home. Well, when I came home from Bakersfield, while I was there, I got onto that little portion about my brother who was a cop in Westchester County, and I did some training on his dog. He found the kennel for sale while I was in Bakersfield. 
and he contacted me. He said, look, there's a kennel in Lewisboro, which is about, uh, at the time I was living in Somers, it was about a 35-minute ride, and he said, uh, it's for sale. So when I got back, I went right over to that kennel, and I spoke to the guy, and I wound up purchasing that kennel. That, and, that's perfect, right? It was, it was perfect timing, and to boot, while I was in Bakersfield, one of the other guys that, that were there, um, one of the trainers, he was a Hawaiian guy, and uh, his name was Charlie, and I convinced him to come back to New York with me. He lived in my home for a while. He came back with me. I bought this kennel, and we started doing training there. We actually, it was a boarding kennel, boarding and grooming kennel, and uh, which I had really, at the time, no interest in. I wanted to be a trainer. And so uh, we started developing a training business there. And we had the boarding and grooming, which, which was the steady money, because at the beginning, the, the training wasn't steady. But like everything else, the more you get the word out there and the more you do the right job, the word of mouth that people provide was more than enough. This, this kennel was on the Connecticut, New York border, very affluent area, Lewisboro in, in New York, uh, Ridgefield, Connecticut, uh, Danbury, Connecticut. Um, it, a lot, of, it a lot was of money in Danbury. A lot of money in that entire area, South Salem, Lewisboro, North Salem. And so I, I built a t tremendous business there. And that's how I met the Goldstein brothers, Dr. Bob and Martin Goldstein, because I took this kennel, I did a total renovation on it, made it capable of holding 200 animals, cats and dogs included. But it held 200 animals. We were doing a phenomenal grooming business where I had taken, I had two groomers five days a week, 20 dogs a day, just for grooming. And then I had boarding. When I bought the kennel, it only held 20 dogs. And I, I renovated it, and I was able to hold uh, 122 dogs of different sizes. I had indoor-outdoor runs, and then I had um, shoreline stainless steel cages I purchased, which a lot of veterinarians use for their animal hospital. Yeah. I bought them because they were all rounded edges, easy to keep clean, stainless steel, very secure. And I had them all different sizes, and so we would put dogs, and we would put dogs of different sizes in them, and then take them out for exercise. And it was a little bit more work that way, but I didn't have time or money to do a large-scale indoor/outdoor facility. You have to go through the whole process for for building different zoning ordinances yeah. and stuff like that. Oh yeah, yeah. And so uh, that kennel. After a while, I decided to. Uh, expand on on the animal hospital side. I, I was building an animal hospital there. And the two Goldstein brothers met me. They had just sold their practice. And they came and said, look, you know, we might be interested. But we want to let you know something. We are 100% holistic. They were getting away from conventional medicine. They're both, they're both veterinarians? or Both two brothers, both veterinarians. Okay. The older brother, Bob, and the younger brother was Martin. And so we struck up a deal, and they leased this portion of the animal hospital. And at the time, people looked at it as quackery. They said, what are you talking about? Well, Bob wound up becoming the, the first name in cryosurgery, developing this technique to freeze a tumor and have it do minimal damage to the, to the tissue surrounding it, but with literally, I've seen, I've seen golf ball sized tumors that these guys were treating with cryosurgery. Two weeks later, look like a, a dried fig on their face. And then subsequently, portions of it get removed and portions of it get absorbed by the body. And this technique was working. And they teamed up with uh, Dr. Lawrence Burton in the Bahamas who was a cancer research therapist who was kind of slapped out of the United States. He went down there, even being very successful in his therapies, he went to the Bahamas, built his own animal, uh, built his own hospital. For? For people. Okay, yeah. He wasn't treating animals. Got it. The Goldstein brothers applied his 
um, cancer therapies to animals. That's cool. It, it was really cool. I got to know him very well because having a daughter with leukemia, so having a daughter of my own with cancer, and being very interested in alternative therapies, uh, he called me one day. He had a problem with the native people uh, breaking into his facility, stealing, trying to steal drugs. He wanted to buy a couple of protective, protective Rottweilers right up my alley. So he flew me down for a couple of weeks. I took three Rottweilers down with me, did some training down there, set up a whole kennel situation for him, secured everything. We fenced everything in down there. And uh, in my time with him, I got to know a lot more about his therapies and stuff like that. And so some of that was applied to my daughter and was very successful. Mm. So wow. I looked at that, and it changed my life. I got very holistic. I got very holistic, started really looking into what I was eating, taking care of myself. And um, wow, I kind of bring back a lot of things for myself here. Yeah, that's a lot. That's, that, that's cool, though, how all that lined up the way it, it did just lined up and so from from that kennel which unfortunately the trips away from home took their toll because i wound up in a divorce i had to sell that kennel and when, after i sold that kennel i went to the only alternative i knew and that was meat i i had had these routes selling different types of meat so i wound up getting a, a small route and still doing the dogs, but the kennel had to go. So you're just doing like in homes and stuff. Just if I would come to the home, do yeah. the training, uh, I wasn't able to keep dogs anymore. And so, uh, I did that for maybe a couple of more years. It was difficult, difficult time for me in my life. Um, my daughter was doing better after, after involving some of these therapies. But the Goldstein brothers are the key to this part of the story because I really learned a lot. Yeah. Learned a lot, not only, not only about the, the health aspect, but I watched surgeries. I really got involved with the entire process of animal health and, and getting into some of the, uh, what I would consider to be the more difficult aspects of caring yeah. for a dog like that. Um, and so I saw all different kinds of issues and they, they were very instrumental and very helpful to me in developing myself further. Uh, and that's why when I started with the organics, I went back to them. I went back to Bob and asked for some help. And he was very willing. We talked for a while, then we got together. I had brought the process along before I had gotten in touch with him, but I knew which direction I wanted to go in, and that was animal health. And to give context, and to get context from you as well, holistic veterinary practices today are not that popular as, as, as many other vets are. So back then that must've, did you, did you, did that, did the clinic get like pushback from the, the public of like, what, what's this? Why are we not so much from the public as much as from other veterinarians and as they do today. today. But I, rec I mean, I, I'm, I'm glad that the Goldsteins were, so hooked on their ideas. They had started their own dog food company. It was called Lick Your Chops, health <laughs> food for dogs, cool. but it was a kibble. And so through the time I spent with them, I learned it was a college education for me from sure. both of them. And uh, I learned it wasn't so much what I, what I liked, it was what was better for the dog. Right. That's, that makes sense. You're not eating the food. You're not eating the food. <laughs> but even something as simple as what most people make mistakes with today, when they feed kibble and raw, you can't mix them. Mm. And something that basic, 
I would have never known. I mean, just from the difference in the digestion and the time it takes to digest kibble and digest raw, there's, mm. a, there's a vast contrast. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to mix them together because then your, your raw is pulling down undigested kibble. The raw takes three to four hours, kibble three times that. So to fully digest, to fully digest, and, and it'll produce gases and, and make it very uncomfortable. A lot of people blame the raw for that, but what they, what they need to do is right. feed it in two separate meals. You give your morning meal, I, I would recommend giving the morning meal kibble if that's what you're going to use because it takes longer to get through the, the dog, and then in the evening, you give your raw so that four hours later you could take your dog out again and he's empty for the night. Mm. But that makes sense. It's a schedule. It, it's it's a factual plus when when having to feed both. You really shouldn't feed mixed together. But people don't always listen to what you say. Yeah, oh yeah. You know, I just do. like you know, I board dogs too, and people say, you know, customers of mine bring their dogs in for boarding. But I can tell if they're eating only my food or if they're eating kibble too, just because I clean the poop. Yeah. And so you could tell the difference. I want to ask you this before I forget, because I'm just interested in... I know I'm bouncing around. No, no, you're not. I'm you're trying to keep it... No, you're not at all. Logical. No, you're not at all. I just, especially when I listen to podcasts, I'm always like, wait, but I wanted to know... Interrupt me anytime. So what... And I'm just trying to get a gauge for the scene back then. So you, so I'm just curious on what, was there no other options to do working dogs? Like you went immediately from Bakersfield back home or that space. And then you immediately went to Germany to do like Dobermans, Rottweilers and Shepherds. Was that just something that you were interested? My personal interest. Okay. Actually Rottweilers. Uh, and I owned, I had one at the time, a phenomenal one. There was a, uh, there was a kennel in, in New Jersey. I can't recall. Saddlebrook, New Jersey. And it was owned by a Hungarian woman, Dr. Vladim, a uh, doctor. Mm, I'm sorry. Doctor. If you don't remember, that's okay. I don't remember what I ate yesterday. I can't so. remember her name. <laughs> she had a broken back and she walked very crooked, but she had put an ad out looking for a trainer. So I went to visit her. Dagmar Hodenarova. Oh, sure. Dr. Dag How'd you forget? Dr. Dagmar Hodenarova and uh, Van Palisaden Rottweilers. She was in the Palisades of New Jersey. Sure, yeah. And so she had a, a adult male Rottweiler specifically, champion dog, and she needed somebody to handle this dog in obedience trials. And so I walked out on her deck and she comes walking out with this 115-pound, four-year-old Rottweiler who was incredibly beautiful. I had a lot of experience with Rotties. So she hands me the leash, and she says, let me see you do some obedience. Now, I knew this dog from nothing, and I knew the results. The first little correction I gave this dog, he came up on me. Mm -hmm. And I did what needed to be done and walked off. Good boy, come on. Give him a couple of little clicks. And we go off, and the dog was mine after that. And she was like, no one can control this dog but you. Cool. And, and that was another little thing that developed, where I started with all these Rottweilers. And, and so it, it kind of happened like that, I think mo mostly because there were not very many people like today. There's one on every corner. There were not many people doing dog training. Mm -hmm. And so when somebody was able to see results in a short period of time, that's what they wanted. Let me ask you this. Rottweilers, so, I, I mean, I deal primarily with pets, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't, don't see a lot of working Rottweilers. And so, well, you know what I mean? They're not working. I might see a working Rottweiler with a pet owner, but I'm not, you know. So Rottweilers had had been in my experience, one of the only dogs that has stayed characteristically breed specific in how they act like consistently. Meaning I'll meet a shepherd, 
an Aussie, um, any other breed, right? And they're all different. But Rottweilers consistently, to me, have always been the same type of behaved dog. And, and as far as personality goes, mm-hmm. they kind of always have this like this um, stoic, like really, f- um, I don't know, hard headed presence. Yeah, like they're just forthright. Yeah. I want to disagree with you a little bit on one thing. Sure. I don't find them all the same. I find that, unfortunately, when a dog gets popular in this country, Mm. it gets destroyed a little bit at a time. Oh, yeah. Overbreeding, poor breeding, um, terrible genetics. I have taken in dogs out of Germany. And this Hans Müller I mentioned earlier was a phenomenal contact for very excellent Rottweilers out of Germany. They have a totally different personality. They have a lot of it has to do with the upbringing, okay? The way they're handled as puppies, and I find that the dogs I get out of Germany are like the the Ferraris of of the breed. They have a very refined, they're not 190 pounds like you see in this country. They look like wine barrels with legs. They're not supposed to be like that. I mean, my average, my, my Rottweiler, if I could make my own, would be about 115 pounds, cobby body, big head with an acaput you can put your mm. cup of coffee on. You say stoic, I say very deliberate. Mm. I see a dog that will look right through you, has very little to say until he does. Right. But here, I find that people want something specific in terms of appearance and don't pay much attention to what's inside. Right. So they'll take a dog that has certain temperament issues, whether it be genetic or learned behavior, it doesn't really matter, but... You take a dog that, all, that starts off with a fault and you breed it for one specific thing, but what comes with it, you don't want, mm. but you have no control over it. And so, so many customers call me, I have a Rottweiler, 180 pounds, and I need him to... Listen, I don't even take the job. I don't take the job because I find American dogs are just always so much more difficult. Do you think it's just, well, there's probably a lot of reasons. A lot of reasons. So I just find um, in the United States that dogs are bred for, people just are getting a shell, right? They're getting like, I want a Rottweiler because they don't think about what's inside. They just think about how it looks and how big they are. And I think that it's just a weird place that we're in, especially as a pet owner trainer right somebody that trains people with dogs right um the working dog training is completely different because it's a it's a different handler it's a different job it's a different dog hopefully and but but what i deal with is families getting dogs because they saw it in a movie or they wanted a big dog or they there's egos involved a lot like i see a lot of people getting these huge Tibetans or these giant Cane Corsos or these big Rottweilers and they're getting a shell. So when you said that you see in Germany in particular, I have um, family in Germany. My mom, my mother-in-law is fluent in German. We go there often. And the way that, and, and same thing with um, her, her mom, which is our great Oma. Um, it's, it's they, the way that they are, are as humans is very structured, very disciplined. Um, it matters to them. And they have breed wardens. Yeah. So they can't. So when you say breed wardens, explain to that a little bit. Okay. I, I don't know if it's different today because obviously I'm a little older now from when I was there. But if it hasn't changed, a, when, when you have a dog, a, a female that you want to breed, I don't care what breed it is, but let's talk about Rottweilers. You have a local breed warden who you can go to who is charged with keeping record of all the bloodlines, and he will give you a choice of maybe three or four or maybe more, maybe maybe six 
different local males that you are approved to breed to because they look at the bloodlines, they look at the offspring, and they choose, they make the decision as to what dog to breed to that would best suit the female, both genetically, size, every important factor. Wow. And it's so important, whereas wow. to compare it to here, what happens is if you own a dog and you want to breed it, you can go breed it to another breed, and no one cares. There's no control over it here. So we take poor quality dogs. Not that all of our dogs are poor quality, and over the last 20 years, it's gotten a lot better because dogs have become more prevalent. Very, yeah. Okay? Since 9-11, I really believe, and I put a... a a brief thing, I wrote up a brief article for something, I don't recall who it was for, but I said that they've become more prevalent since 9-11 because people now trust them. They see what oh, they were wow. able to do. Wow, I didn't even think of that. So now you, you have a whole different, whole different game in the United States, but what I'm talking about are people that take poor quality dogs, put it together with their neighbor's dog in the backyard, and they have a litter of 12 Poor quality dogs. Cha-ching. Cha-ching. Correct. That's what it's about. Yeah. Whereas in Germany, I don't care what kind of money. You, you follow the direction of the breed warden. And it was like that with all the communist countries. Just like Slovakia. Just like Poland. Just like Hungary. Austria. I can't tell you how many times in the middle of the night I went through little creeks trying to get through the borders in, in Hungary with dogs you know, sticking them into a car. Back in the day, it was a totally different world. But that's the problem in the United States that I feel, where there's no control, and when it's only about the money, you what you the pay. dog suffers. Yeah. You get what you pay for. Or not, even, you know? Well, that's, <laughs> you know, that's maybe... the flip side of that yeah. coin. It's, uh, it's just a weird thing, because for me, I have this really um, pivoting aspect because I'm educated in what like what you're talking about and what you've been through and what you do dog owners wouldn't have any idea that that existed or meaning uh working dogs purpose good genetics good diet good nutrition good structure good training there's the side of pet ownership in the United States has been commercialized so much it's part of our lifestyle which is good that's what dogs are for pets are pets are for but they don't they don't understand what you're talking about where you know because there's this whole so I guess my point is is I deal with a lot of people it's already too late they've gotten the dog the, it, the dog is already eight months intact and now is having problems and the family loves the dog and now this giant intact shepherd or this working line dog is starting all of a sudden Right, mm -hmm. always, all of a sudden, <laughs> when we hit this sexual maturity, the dog changes, and I'm like, "Well, what happened to you after you stopped watching Barney and you started watching Top Gun or whatever?" I'm like, "You matured." Absolutely. So I'm in this weird space where um, it, it's too much information, and it front loads the dog owner too much to to tell them exactly why their dog is doing the things that it's doing. You know what I mean? It's, I agree. But I don't. It's not gonna. It's past that. It's too far. I find the only difficulty I've had and kind of carried through my training career is it's never the dog. Right. It's the people. The people are the ones that need to get the education. You need to teach the basics of why a dog will respond to different things differently as it matures. Yeah. But I've always given the people more time because for mm. me the dogs were the easy part the easy. people were always difficult especially and i'll probably make some enemies saying this but after i became a police officer now you have to deal with that police mentality and i'll call it police mentality where it, it i found it always or not always but most of the time had to be hey, how do i look yeah how's it look it was dog. about them. Yeah, it was yeah. about them. And I, I constantly tell my wife, it's never about me. It's always about the dog. It has to be. If you want to get the best job, it has to be about the dog. 
And no matter what they throw at you, and Rottweilers can throw a lot of different things at you. You know, you get one that's a little, uh, I'll call it forthright. I won't call it stubborn. You get one a little forthright, and he's a little uh, sensitive about downing. A little insecurity maybe, you know, a couple of different reasons, but he doesn't want to down. You have to come up with different ulterior, or excuse me, you have to come up with different methods to achieve the same goal. For example, I had a Rottweiler. Whenever I wanted to get him to down, he would try to eat me. I got a post hole digger, and I dug a hole in the ground, and I put a four-by-four, a a two-foot four-by-four post in the ground, dirt level, and I screwed a big eye hook into the top of it, put my leash through the eye hook. So Mm. all I had to do to down that dog was pull it to me, and that dog went straight down. Well, you know what? It worked for a while until he realized that he was strong enough to stand up and pull that thing out of the ground. (laughs) So I had to cement it in, okay? This is how I got around it, but I never try to muscle them. Mm. You'll lose every time. Mm -hmm. If you think he won't bite you, you're fooling yourself. Mm -hmm. And so you develop different techniques to get around it. I try to explain to people, as a professional trainer, I don't expect you, and I very rarely will show people how I get it done because you don't want them putting themselves in a bad position. Yeah. You have to watch what you show them. It's a perfect example of too much information is not good. Mm. So I usually like to tell people, leave your dog with me for a month, and then I'll start the hard part. I got to work with you. Mm. Okay, and and it worked for me. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's, and I and I grew up in it. I'm gr- I'm I'm growing up in the industry in a different time. Totally. So for me, it's easier and harder at the same time because when I work a dog, especially when I'm paid to work with the dog, and an example, a seminar when there's 70 people around and everyone's got their phones out. It's, I have to be more talented and more creative because when I have a dog that needs to do something or not do something, I have to be mindful about the opinions of not only the people that are holding the cameras, ones watching that. but the people who are going to watch, where they're going to post this. <sighs> so it's, it's, you can argue about social media and what it's done to society and specifically the dog training industry, but for me... I find it to be the biggest learning opportunity because anytime I'm at a point in my career that anytime I get a dog out, there's eyes. Everyone wants to see what I'm going to do, you know, and, you know, and it's like, oh, what's going to happen here? And then if I'm in an environment where, again, people are paid to watch me do that or learn from that or see how I'm going to do it, I have to be very mindful that I can't. I can't do certain things or think about certain things. And it's not even about doing things that are maybe taboo. It has nothing to do with that. It's about I need to be able to relay information to the dog successfully and the owner while looking good on the fly. And that's become really challenging for me. So I would argue, um, and, and I not argue, but I guess just give insight on um, it's, it's definitely changed where – I think if you have, because there's, there's great, there's dog trainers that will do circles around me that will work in the back, but they can't teach the owner how to do it because are you, are you crazy? Why did you do that? And the, and then, and then they'll leave a review and say, this person is an asshole. <laughs> and you know what I mean? I think you're describing me. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> that's, that's what I always tell people is like, like you just said, and I say this all the time, like the dogs are 95% of, or I'm sorry, the people are 95% of the dogs are 5%. And in some cases, maybe if it's a neurotic behavioral case, it's maybe 10%. But I say, it's not about how it is. It is important how good you are with handling dogs, but what's more important is how you're able to teach the owners. I know that you know this, but I think that for me, it's such a, it makes you a better trainer, a better handler, because you have to get so creative and so well-spoken about how you're going to do things because there's always going to be, very rarely do I just get a dog to mess around with with myself anymore, unfortunately. I'm going to add something to that. Okay. Uh, First of all, I agree. 
I would love to just be one on one with a personal dog. Yeah. Not rushed, not have a million other things to do. That's like a dream. But I have two children that are police officers, a daughter and a son. I was a police officer. Sometimes early on in their careers, which wasn't that long ago, but they would ask different things about, you know, how I handle things. Cannot be handled the same. It's a different world out there today. Right. What I was taught in the police academy may get someone jammed up today. Mm -hmm. It's the same with dog trainers. Yeah. It's, it's the cell phone. It's, it's the camera on the cell phone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because like everything else you see on TV, that's getting stuck in, in you know, and they, and they edit it. You know, they know how to make it look yeah. bad. Yeah. And you have a lot more to think about. Not only that, but I'll say this. I did very little public training, what I would call public training. I didn't do pets for the most part. Right. I was a working dog guy. I was, I, you know, I, I actually at one point I, I, I almost started my own helper school. I was big into being the helper. I was a I was the dog bone all the time. I enjoyed it. So I did ex it. explain what the helper is for people who maybe don't. Okay, know. the helper is the guy that that has to have. I'll call him an actor. He has to really. He has to have the ability, regardless of the environment and the situation, to be authentic enough, to turn that dog aggressionally on. Um, and know whether it's offensive, defensive, uh, different techniques that always benefit the dog. It's always about the dog. So you want to do things, and you have to know when to get in, when to get out. What I mean by that is sometimes, you know, you present your bite, and you may see something in the dog that you don't want to reward him, so you don't give him the bite. Uh, is there a difference between a decoy and a helper? I don't know. I, a decoy and a helper to me is the same thing. So it's the and for those of you who are listening, it's basically because you know people are listening. We may not know. So it's the the guy in the suit or the the sleeves and stuff. Bite suit. Bite suits have gotten more popular now, but for me, in my early days, it was only a sleeve, <laughs> and it didn't come all the way up to the shoulder either. <laughs> But, and it uh, didn't have extra padding. No, no, no. Actually, we used to use. Uh, I I had a uh, a leather gauntlet. Yeah. And and you put a jacket over the top of it. Oh, that's that, it. That's it. Oh boy. Yeah, that's it. But that's where that's where I really prevailed. I, I was good at at getting that dog. I could probably get any dog to bite me, <laughs> without touching it. But uh, you know, the, that's. That's the way I handled people that watched me train. So I had a neighbor who wanted some help with a dog, and the wife said to him, "Oh no, he's like in the army. He, you know, he does this, he does that." Well, you know what? She's not wrong. I I'm a very strong handler, um, and while I know when to and when not to dominate a dog, they know that I had a little saying: G O D D O G. I'm God, he's dog. The sooner he knows that, the better off this relationship is going to be. And as a police officer and a, and a certified New York State canine trainer, I got the job done. My dogs were noticeable. They were called Pompilio dogs. If you got a dog from me, you could tell. What's that Pompilio? That's my last name. Oh, it is? <laughs> Frank Pompilio. That's it. Now I know. There you go. The sound is, it, sounds, it sounds like way more like... Not that technical. Okay, Just cool. A little Italian guy from Yonkers. <laughs> but I will say that to give context again, and this is why I, I, I really wanted you on and, and I'm enjoying you on, is because people need to realize that not every dog... So here's what's happening, I think, and especially in the politics, which we won't get into, but... The when you get somebody that has a um, let's say um, um, I don't know golden retriever or lab or a mix at home and they're just this pet mom was a pet dad was a pet has been for ten they're all their genetics has just been sleeping at home and going to the lake house on the weekends. What you're talking about are not those dogs. Definitely not. Definitely not. So the training that you are doing and still do is requires to be different because the dog that's in front of you 
is completely, it's the difference between a fake gun and a real gun. Absolutely. And I think that that's important for people to realize because out of context or anybody watching or listening to this or just in general, whoever, the thousands of people that are going to listen to this in the future, it's important for, and I think that's the, that, that would solve most politics in the dog space is because I think what happens is, is you get, you get lobbyists and pet owners that will say, this is the way to train a dog. This is the way to feed a dog. This is the, this is how things go. And it's, they're like, this is applicable for all little cute dogs that we see. And you are from a completely different, um, era. Go ahead. You can say it's not era. It's, it's, uh, it's a department, right? With military dogs, working dog, police dogs, dogs that we're, are getting dropped off at Macy's in the seventies to, 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 they are getting faced with people, um, criminals, thugs that are willing to kill them on the spot for a, 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 a suitcase. And so the training that you're doing or have done or, or other people do, I think it's important for people to realize that because that's what happens is you'll see, and it happens to me too, is I'll see a dog that comes in that's supposed to be that dog, right? Somebody paid $5,000 for this really well-bred working dog or what I've been seeing a lot of are these boar bulls and these dogs that are just not supposed to be in pet homes. Absolutely. They spiral out of control. The breeder shouldn't have, I don't know how they get these dogs, right? But when we're training with those dogs, the tools, techniques, methods, and training style has to be different from the dog that I train at home that's the, the doodle or the golden or the couch potato. But that's not what they see. They say, oh, you don't need to use this wine. The, my dog at home, I just use and a couple pieces of cheese. So I just want to, A, give context to people out there who are listening for your sake. Um, not that it matters, but I think it's a, such an important piece of this conversation because not at era. It's the style of training and your history and your background and your knowledge and your expertise is working with dogs, but it's not pet dogs. And that, that line needs to be drawn. I agree. And I won't go as far as saying it is less refined, my style. It is refined, but it, it encompasses the fact that not most, all of the dogs that I've worked with for police, military, executive protection, because I also left out a little section of my past. I had a very large security company, and I had 50 man-dog teams working at different homeless facilities. I was hired by different counties because these facilities were producing so much trouble that it was, it was causing uh, stress on the local police departments. They didn't have enough personnel to mm. be going to so many calls in one location. So I was hired by, by um, a firm to come in and help resolve the issue. It was almost like having a private police department. Right. My guys were armed. Um, they, were, they had dogs and they patrolled and it was extremely successful. Was the guys that you usually had on your team, were they... Um Retired police or some were some were not but I I trained everyone, you know, I whether they were retired police or uh, Just security guards if you will um, I trained them all and they all handled import dogs. They all handled uh, I mean I had not they were all dual-purpose dogs. We did drug searches. We helped local police departments in the area and it was very very successful but what I find is, I'll put it plainly, they have to be handled firmly. You, you know, I'm not pulling, pulling out a little slice of liver and handing it to the dog to, to listen to what I'm telling them. I'm not into tree training. And I, I notice, and my wife and I have this conversation more often than I'd like to admit, I'm, I'm not a, a firm believer in treats. At the end of the whole thing, oh yeah, I'm going to love him up. But I want him or her the dog, meaning, I want the dog to want to obey. I want him to do it for me, mm. not because of what I'm going to do for him. I, I believe that the bond is the most important thing between the handler and the dog. Mm. And 
the dogs are getting better now in this country. But in the day, and I'll use that term because for me it applies, everything had to come from Europe if you really wanted a good dog because of the way they, they did it there. And I say something frequently to people when they start talking about dogs in Europe. The first time I, I had the, the opportunity to go to Europe and I was traveling in the countryside, every, every field that you come to would have a Schutzen Club or a group of people with a group of dogs. And I, I kind of compare it in this country to the Little League. Here you see you know, so many Little League games and all these people. That's how they treat their dogs in, in Europe. They always held them in a much higher regard. Yeah. And that's what changed, in my opinion, with 9-11, where suddenly you saw the value of what we have here. Because of all the dogs that went in to help after. Exactly. Right? And how successful they were. And now all these search and rescue dogs. You, you really... I can't tell you how many times I was on the street with my canine. And... You're doing a track, and you got three or four people, little old ladies standing there pointing to the left, and your dog's pulling you to the right, and she's going, he went over there. How many guys listen to the people? Right. Not me. I let that dog do his thing. The guy might have went that way, but he's over here now. Mm-hmm. And, and I, and I want to say this, too, and, I, and I'm... And this is just a really nice conversation. I'm, I'm really happy that you agreed to do this, but I want to say... That when, when you say things like, you want the dog to do it for you, it's important. Again, I want to paint a picture for people out there because, again, this is where the negative side of being, in, um, being a trainer and then being a trainer and producing content because there's a lot of ego involved. So if somebody does it different, they don't care that they're yielding results and or um, that they're a trainer. They're, they're upset because they're doing it differently than them and that hurts their ego right and i want to say something and highlight something that you said so when you say that you want the dog to perform for you when you ask not because you got cheese and beef liver in your you know in your whatever Uh, yeah you don't have that italian i always say that you don't have an italian deli to get your dog to do stuff it's important to understand before uh I'm, i'm a big fan of watching cops it's my favorite show It's great. You lived it for a while. I just like sitting at my couch eating pork rinds watching it. (laughs) It's a lot easier. So I was watching this canine and and I want to paint a picture. So there was this armed robbery where this this guy uh, in California robbed uh, or not. He he did a robbery. I don't know what it was, but then he carjacked this old lady. Get out. He had a gun. Um, and then he went on the run. And so the, the police officers were chasing him. They found out where he was and, and adrenaline. And I couldn't imagine what that's like to know that you're searching for a guy that could ultimately fire at you. Like that's gotta be, it's dangerous. It's every, it's everything. Normally humans want to run away from that. <laughs> you guys, most humans, yeah, you guys want to go towards that. And, and that's, that's, um, uh, incredibly, um, it's just a different different way of thinking. It's and it's it's really brave and there's a lot to say about that. But anyway, so they all kind of waited for the canine because they were like, oh, because they were he was behind this wall and that's the thing and all the neighbors were doing this and so they got the canine out and I just want to paint a picture when and it's not necessarily this dark in this scenario but when this guy came out with his dog. He, tr- he tracked him. They're going. He's got his long line on, and the dog's got his nose to his ground. And he was apprehensive. He was he was he was going to bite this guy. You know, he wasn't just going to say, "Hey, there he is. Okay, give me my ball." So when they got there, they found out where he was, and he kind of locked himself in this back. Um, it was like a lean-to garage outside, and so he had like old cars and like b- bunch of metal stuff, and he kind of like was pushing all these things like um, the power tool sets and the the big um whatever cloth big wardrobes and just pushing everything and he's back there and so the dog is you know he's getting fired up and in these moments this these are moments between life and death for human beings that's what people don't understand you having that dog here ready to talk you know you know, pocking this guy in, he's got him here and he's getting ready to let go of the dog. He can't say, hey, buddy, hey, um, let me give you a little, let me give you a little treat. You're going to sit down first. No, 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 no. It's when I tell you I need you to down or 
or whatever command you're going to use to go. There is no, well, everyone, hold on, let's, let's pause the chopper in the sky. The 40 officers that are around with guns drawn, waiting to go home to their wife and kids when their heart is going, and you're sweating. It's just a really um, stressful environment. They can't look at the dog and say, like, is this dog going to perform for treats or a ball today? It has to be done. And I want to say that because I watched it last night, and it kind of like, what? They give me goosebumps. Goosebumps? Bringing back memories, am I? You are. <laughs> so I, I, I just want to be clear because it, it drives me. It used to drive me <laughs> mentally insane when there were people out there, and still to this day, that will say this is the way that we train dogs, not not that way. And I want to be clear. No, 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 no. That's a way to train a dog. But when we're talking about, so then I want to just really quickly, we're going to take that same dog, that same Malinois in this case, that or German Shepherd that's supposed to be doing that, and then Karen and Scott next door get the same dog. And I said, I can't. Listen, I'm not going to train this dog the way that you trained your Doodle or your Boston Terrier because this is a different dog. Yeah, but the guy online or the girl online said that we shouldn't, and I go, I don't care. <laughs> That's what I was just going to interrupt you to say. Cool. You got to know, as a trainer, when to tell them. You yeah. got to let them. Some people are apprehensive, and sometimes it gets down to that dollar thing. Yeah. Okay, some people don't want to let the work go. But as a police officer with a dog, I, you, I used to watch that cops too. Okay? <laughs> you don't and anymore? What, well, I can't because when I see these guys come out of a car and grab their dog with a pinch collar on and they're holding them, trying to hold them back and almost get dragged down, that's a training problem. Yeah. My dog was never on a leash unless I wanted him on a leash. Yeah. I would keep my – if I had a little uh, little button on my – my belt, if I needed to, it had a solenoid in the car, I pressed the button, the back door popped open. My dog knew if that door was open, unless I told him to stay, it was because I wanted him out. So I'll give you a quick example. Please. I was, I was on a stolen car chase through the city that I worked in. And they called for mutual aid. And so... What's that? Mutual aid. Other departments send cars to help. So it's a big thing. It, it was a big enough thing. And so, you know, you got, you got four cars from other departments. So two different departments sent two cars each. So we had four cars plus two from my job. And I was in direct pursuit of the car. The guy bails out. I get in a foot chase. The guy goes up the stairs. Now, of course, when I bail out, I pop my door. My dog is running. The guy goes up into a house. Now, not every situation is for a dog, no matter how hairy it gets. And so I down my dog, uh, like right at the curb, as I come up the stairs. I go up into the house after this guy. So I follow him into the apartment. You know, you're kicking down doors, knocking things out of the way. I grab hold of this guy. All of a sudden, the doors bust open. Four cops come running in. One cop with a dog on a leash. And I hear him say, holy... Can I curse? Yeah, you can curse. Holy shit. <laughs> Did you see that Malinois out on the street? They ran right past my dog. My dog didn't move because he didn't hear me call him or he didn't see me in trouble. That's the kind of control that you need to have. Yeah. And the biggest issue that I find, and this is the reason I'm bringing this out right now, I'm not trying to make enemies out there. You got to work on what your dog does the worst. You got to, mm. all, the, all the weak points is what you should work on most. The bite work is always fun, but the control in that environment is the most important thing in my opinion. Safety. Always. Always it, have to be first. Let's say, like, you know, switching switching gears a little bit. If, let's say, your dog, you know, saw um, all the chaos going up and your obedience wasn't good and he gets up. Now he's just searching for who knows. Part of the problem. Exactly. So it it's, becomes part of the problem. It's like, um, you know, now you got a loaded gun just kind of walking around thinking, like, oh, that kid's running. That, that seven-year-old's running. Absolutely. You know, and then... Absolutely. And then, and then, you know, it's just important because people don't realize that, I, and I always put this for my dog owners who are really struggling with taking things seriously. And I go, I want you to think of the worst case scenario that can happen. And I want to let you know that that could happen if you don't take this seriously. So you got to push, 
it's not about what's good f- for you. It's about what's good for your dog, like you said. Always. So, all right. So fast forward to when did you get in? Did you did you go military first or, or law military enforcement? Military first, law enforcement. And law enforcement was really, and I don't mean to put it this way, but the truth of the matter is I had done everything with dogs I possibly could do. A uh, little bit of work with Blackwater. Um, as a, as a uh, bomb dog tech, uh, I, I wanted to become a police officer because I wanted to handle a dog on the street. Mm, that makes sense. However, I was already 40. I became a police officer at 42. How, when did you get into the military? 18 years old. When you were 18? 18 years did old. Did you work, you work dogs in the military? or? I did. The whole time? One year. However, as a police officer, having the opportunity to run the gamut of tracking, obedience, because we would do many demos Mm. of, uh, you know, we had D.A.R.E. programs. I, I don't think they do D.A.R.E. anymore, but every D.A.R.E. graduation in the city where I worked, all dog demos. Uh, we used to do a thing called the Iron Dog Competition. I think they still do that. They may. I used to win them all, I'll tell you the truth. <laughs> but uh, there, was, there was the gamut of training that you got an opportunity to actually see in the process. Yeah. Uh, you know, so I used to love doing tracks, hard surface tracks, you know, down the street, up into a, a house, and really finding the guy and watching and trusting that dog. However... Like you said, not every track ends in a bite. So as a trainer, we had to we had to do both. We had to give your dog a bite at the end of some tracks, but you had to keep you had to maintain a balance of training. You do a bite at the end of every track and then you expect your dog to go track a little kid or or right. like I had a track one time an old man had just uh, Alzheimer's mm-hmm. suffer had wandered out of his house and when the people woke up their father was gone. And so I had to do a track. You don't want your dog tearing up some poor old guy. I, I found him in the front porch of some house a half a mile away that was covered up for the winter with all tarps. He was underneath it sitting on a chair, like zero degrees outside oh, in Jesus. his underwear. So, you know, things like that that, that come up, you, you have to maintain a balance all the time. Too much of one thing will, will interfere yeah. with something else. You do too much Pendulum. obedience. You're going to suppress your bite, your, your, your aggressive work. Right. You do too much aggression work, you're going to lose control. Mm-hmm. You know, everybody has, like as a trainer, and you say everybody has a different way of training. Should. I believe, like, I started doing uh, obedience outs, I call them. I taught my dog to out during obedience, not bite work, because now he's at the height of distraction. Yeah. You know, it's almost like slapping you in the face and then trying to talk you down instead of trying to talk you down and then smacking you in the face. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, there's, a, Absolutely. there's a progression. And, and so I was criticized for some of my training techniques. Um, another thing I like to do is I like to get puppies biting right away. Mm-hmm. I like to get them on a sleeve. I'll show you pictures of my, wife, my wife's last litter. I got five little puppies on a sleeve. They pulled my pants down. I'm standing there in my mudans, you know, just... <laughs> <laughs> shaking these dogs. Everyone has a little bit different way of doing it, but I found that what worked best for me was the way I was doing it. I got the best results. That's it. You know, even, and I'll touch on this too, you do a building search. The way, the way when I became a police officer that the police were doing it, they'd get a build, you know, they, they have their buildings that they work in, you know, you get different different people, different building owners in your community that let you use empty buildings and stuff. So Mm -hmm. these guys were standing at the front door, giving their warning, and this is even with a green dog, giving their warning and then releasing that dog into this vast area to search, find the bad guy, and alert, whether he's barking if he can't get at him or if he goes right in for a bite. So it's not even alerting it at that point. It's just it's just yeah. sending them in. I would start, I would take the dog into the building, give my warning, but go into the building with the dog on a lead. And at least initially, 
knowing where the guy was, going to that location, and letting the dog alert, and giving the dog a bite, and then gradually moving him further and further out, rather than starting him with the vast area, right. and having him make too many mistakes before he actually gets to the guy. And so, it's probably also too mentally about the reward that the dog will get immediately. Absolutely. They didn't, they work, ha- they didn't work for it. They didn't have to work that hard for it. Yeah. yeah, I make them work. Nobody gets away without working. If Frankie has to work, everybody's working. Good. But it, it worked for me. So I, I would try to implement my way of doing things, and it doesn't get looked on as favorably when you try to change things that have been going on. You know what's interesting I find, and maybe you have experience on this, is... When, um, so Chris Jones was a, he is a, he was a, he was a law enforcement officer before he was a canine, but he was the one that was, uh, training a lot of the dogs. He was the helper. He was the decoy because he just, and he wasn't doing it for any money. He was just like, we need good help here. As I did myself. I used to help. I used to do all the helper work for the local police departments before I became a cop. So I, so I, one thing I found really interesting is I remember we sold this, um, that shepherd that I was telling you about, Lucas, he's, he was just, like you said, he was, he was a European dog from Slovakia and he was the most, when he turned on, it was like, you know, he turned on, but then when he chilled, like he was just like a like a family pet. He was just like chilling, you know. He was just like on a on the benign. Yeah, just I, I couldn't believe how. I think your wife passed you water here. I don't know if you need some. <laughs> Why well, I sound like I'm getting a little dry. <laughs> so I just when you talk about breeding, that dog stands out to me because he was kind of like this dog and I'll never forget like the the way that he would look at situations like we'd have him on a down stay at our facility and he'd be just chewing on this bone and and then we'd get him up and then we'd do this whole scenario where we do a we do our announcements coming into the building with a passive decoy and that's really when you know the dog. If you need the dog to bite, they will. The, you know, Chris is just <laughs> just standing there. standing there. Mm-hmm. And then he'd do all that and just be a beast. And then he'd go over with his bone and be chewing on it. And dogs would be bark, and he'd just be doo, doo, doo. and I was just like, man, I have never seen a German Shepherd stateside that balanced, where they knew when to turn on, and then they're like, I'm done working. I'm and gonna let it go. Yeah, but that's it's a good dog. It was un. Believable, and I've and I and I and I work primarily. Eighty percent of my clients are either they're shepherds, um, and then the other twenty percent are doodles. <laughs> so, but I remember after we sold him, or during the process of we sold him, we went to meet the guy that basically is the he's the one who distributes dogs for the area, canine guy, and uh, and then he brings him to the academy. But anyway, so we get out, and he said, "Hey, this is the potential handler." meet him nice to meet you good this is lucas and you could tell he was the handler was nervous the officer was nervous kind of like well you know and we're like he's totally cool like you're good like you don't have to worry about him at all you know because i think their mentality of a police canine is like they're mean and aggressive ferocious all the time yeah and i'm sure some of them are but he wasn't and so (laughs) I just remember him being nervous and I'm sitting there kind of thinking like, right, I don't, I'm a pet guy, right? I don't get it. I mean, I have gotten into it because I like to know, I like to educate myself about it because mm-hmm. it get, it makes me better when I'm talking to dog owners. Absolutely. So I'm sitting there and I, and I know, and I've never, you know, done it before. So we're doing this basically business. Like he's got to find the ball in the tall grass and whatever. And that's all they really cared about, to be honest, was that drive, that hunt drive. They finish everything else off in the academy. So the guy's like, oh, I've never had a, They've never had a dog before. And I'm like, oh, like, okay, this is your first street dog? He's like, no, I've never had a dog before. And I'm like, I'm thinking, like, really? So it really caught me by surprise because we're, we're like, hey, you know, let's take a picture. Because we were excited. We sold the dog. Yeah. And he, we did good work. Accomplishment. Yeah. And we were excited about that. We didn't, you know, we, we got paid for it. We didn't make any money. Um, 
so it wasn't that. It was just like, this is cool because I felt cool knowing that I used and Chris had used our innate capabilities and now that dog is going to go keep a community safe. He's going to find the bad guys and the drugs and he's going to go to parades and cool. That's a cool feeling. But the guy was so nervous and I just, I have never forgotten that. And he's probably, they, they went through the academy and they're great and he's on the streets and he's really great dog. But that just really surprised me that uh, the amount, so I guess my point is, is a lot of departments it's kind of like a lottery system, it has seemed. But Chris Jones, for an example, who was decoying everyone's dogs in the area and had more knowledge about working dogs and breeding and everything, and he couldn't get the position because it's more po- political or whatever. It's not, I shouldn't say that he, did, he couldn't get the position. It's just you got to wait your turn. But it was just interesting seeing how all that worked where like when you got into the industry, did you, or into the um, police force, did you find it that it was easier for you to get the canine position because you're like, guys, I've been doing this already 20 years. You want to hear another story? Yeah, I do. All right. (laughs) And so I get hired by this department and um, I had sold them dogs prior. The department. The department. I had sold them dogs prior. So we had a working relationship and so when I got hired, um, a, f- a good friend of mine was on the job already, and they had gotten his dog from me. It was a, uh, they had four canines. And so when I got hired, uh, I had, a, I had a, a street dog already. I came from one department, one part-time department to a full-time department. With and your I, dog, your dog transferred? Well, I had a dog, but my dog didn't transfer onto the new job. They didn't, okay. they didn't hire me as a canine. Got it. <clears throat> and so uh, about a year later, the chief came to me. He said, you finish with your one-year probation. How about when are you going to bring your dog on? I said, is that an invitation, chief? He said, absolutely. Let's start you with your dog. So now we were going to five dogs. And, uh, you know, word got around the job. And one of the guys come up to me, and uh, he snapped me in the balls, Mm -hmm. doubled me over. He says, I just want to tell you something. It ain't right that you're getting a dog. He said, people are waiting here five years. And my answer to him after I was able to straighten up. (laughs) And breathe. Is if you ever do that to me again, I'll kill you. (laughs) But the fact of the matter is, that chief was smart because he wanted the best guy for the job. And he got it. And so that was the beginning of my police canine career. A little bit rocky, but... uh, And I came out with a dog that was ready to go on the street. I just had to certify him. And so I went through the process, and uh, and that's how it happened. But it is still very political. Now, I started, I got my uh, instructor's certification. So I was able to do canine schools. How do you do... What do you... Who do you go through for that? Uh, did you go? New York State Bureau of Municipal Police, BMP. And so yeah. they, they set out the criteria, at least then, they set out the criteria, and they make you go, like, I used to train in the city of Yonkers with their canine trainer, and then I used to go down to New York City and train with them, and you have to put in a certain amount of hours as what they called a co-trainer in the schools, and uh, so they would have a canine school with maybe 15, 20 different departments in the city of Yonkers coming. Depends. Sometimes it was five or six. But I had to do a certain amount of schools as a co-trainer before I was able to certify and qualify as a, as a, tra- a canine trainer. Mm-hmm. So, you know, all that took place. And, you know, the biggest problem I had, I got a call one time from a chief of one of the guys that was in the school. And he said, I just want to tell you, my guy's not going to have to scoop the poops because what we used to do is each guy would have one week of taking care of the kennel because all the dogs stayed at the school kennel Mm -hmm. while these guys were in training. Well, I said, I'll tell you what, if he ain't going to scoop, he's going home because I ain't going to teach him. And it became a big thing. Why wasn't he scooping? He didn't want to. Okay. He didn't feel like, uh, you know, it was the thing to do. And so... I said, well, everybody's doing it, and if he's not doing it, I'm not, te- I'm not including him. And so it kind of came around my way because it's all part of it. You know, it's, it's a team, him and the dog, but you're also going to be in a situation sometimes 
especially uh, where you you know you got multiple dogs on one department or mutual aid. You get somebody from a different department with another dog. These dogs all got to work together, and so do the guys. Right. And so, you know, this is this is something that everybody has to participate in. It's not about. It's about paying your dues, but it's also making sure that you can trust that person to play with the to team. To take care of these dogs and, and, and you know, yeah. be an acting part of the team. Yeah. How long were you on the, how long were you a canine officer? Uh, to all toll? Different jobs, 17, 17 years. And you're retired now, obviously. I'm retired for a long time now. I retired in 2006. Mm. Officially 2011. I got hurt. A number of times, I went out on disability. I had I, had, uh, I had a situation with the dog where I sent my dog, and he went over a, he went up some stairs and he jumped over the railing and he was running on a flat roof. It was night, chasing the perp, and I jumped over the railing and I was you know in tow right behind him. And then all of a sudden, I didn't realize that we got to the end of the roof. Oh shh! The bad guy got down. The dog went down, and Frankie went down behind the two of them. Uh, the dog got him. Uh, bit him real good on the top of the back of the shoulder. I couldn't even I couldn't even get up off the ground. I, I managed to get to him, but that was the beginning of uh, the demise of my knees. Sure. <laughs> and so I went out that time, and then I re-injured it again. And after a while, I, I I'd be in a foot pursuit, and I would just go down. It would just give out. And the doctor said that's it. And so I tried. They went. I went through 18 independent medical exams trying to get back on, but. Uh, didn't work out. Mm. So a few years later, they retired me. How many live bites did you have? Your dog, not Per you. year? <laughs> per year? No, like in your career, did you have a lot? I averaged probably six to eight a month. Holy crap. <laughs> I used my dog. Listen, my jobs at the time, and now again, we're going back a little bit. Um, my... my criteria set forth by my department was misdemeanors and above okay so at the time if you're sitting down smoking a joint you know in public and I tell you you know put the thing down or and you decide you're going to run and I can send my dog I didn't right I but see. I could yeah. okay now you know the in the force continuum the dog use has elevated and rightly so. They do a lot of damage really fast. Yeah. But uh, um, what was the <clears> – <throat> do you have a story that you could tell me that was, like, really memorable of, like, just memorable in general? doesn't have to be dangerous or scary or – Absolutely. What, what's, like – what's the most memorable story you had with your dog? Okay. So uh, myself and a couple of other guys from my job went to uh, – we were in the 2000 World Police Olympics. Mm -hmm. And so it went very well for us. But on the way back, I noticed at, you know, during tracks and stuff, during training, I had a German Shepherd at the time. He was getting tired very quickly. Now, when you're one-on-one -on -one with your dog, I mean, I was always, my dog and I were one. And I've had a few of them on the street. You notice little things. Like, my wife knows if they, they breathe different. She knows every little aspect. Oh, the dog, something's wrong with the dog. He's, he, his face doesn't look right. And, mm. and it yeah. ticks me off because she's always right. Yeah. And so I'm, I get back and I get a new dog. What happened was this dog, I, he started getting an extended abdomen. I took him to the vet. He had a football-sized tumor attached to his heart. He was only four years old. Whoa. The, the vet said, I don't even know how this dog is alive. But he said, we can take it off. And if he survives, he'll never be able to go back to work. So I talked to the chief. I personally, I was in a bad way financially at the time. So I couldn't afford to five $6,000 surgery. So the chief said to me, listen, you know, I, 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 I could see paying for the surgery if, if you said to me the dog would be able to come back to work. He said, I can't justify it that the dog will not be able to return to work. He said, I'm sorry. He said, if you want to, you know, get up donations and everything else, 
I, I'm really big on the quality of life for my dogs. And so I made the decision myself, and I'm not sorry for it, but I put them down. Really difficult for me. Really difficult for me. But I put him down, and the chief approved me to go to Slovakia to get another dog. Mm. I go to Slovakia. They give me the, they give me the time to go. And uh, I'm there for a week. I check 140 dogs. Wow. I can't buy one. There wasn't one that I wanted. There was one that was okay, but he was a really long-haired German Shepherd, really big dog. I really, I, I liked, I bought him. I took him back, but I wound up selling him to another department, very small department without half the problems of the one that I worked for. So he worked out good for him, but I wound up bringing in a Malinois from the Netherlands, 100 pounds. He was like a torpedo without fins. This dog was incredible. And I, I do all the training. I go and certify him. First day on the street, we got a um, possible burglary, alarm going off, open door spotted. They send me. So I'm like all hepped up. I'm, I can't believe it. The first day on the street with this dog, and mm. we're going we're gonna to go. So I get to this place. It was a mechanic shop, repair shop, something like that, down by the river. And uh, sure enough, an open door. So, you know, sometimes when you're on a job, you have some of the other officers that like the dogs and some that don't. Well, the lieutenant that I was working for that night did not like the canine unit. He thought we were a scam. <laughs> so I was out to, set, to change his mind. I get to this place. I give my warning. City of so-and-so, please canine, come out, I'm going to re release my dog. I give my warning three times, and the dog's name was Bricks. I said, oh, come on, Bob. get in there, Bricks. He was all fired up. He goes blasting in this place, <laughs> and it was around Christmas time. All of a sudden, the fight was on. There's all kinds of ruckus coming out from the inside, shit breaking. You hear stuff hitting the floor. All of a sudden, everything gets quiet. Myself and this lieutenant, he says, come on, we got to get in there. We all go in tactically. My dog has got a six-foot rabbit, a stuffed rabbit that was leaning <laughs> up against this Christmas tree. He had that shit all torn off. <laughs> and this lieutenant looked at me, and he said, I told you, you scammer. <laughs> all right? So there you go. That's a good story. <laughs> And let me tell you, I don't live it down. I thought it was hysterical, but boy, they were mad at me. This guy's office was torn apart. <laughs> but that happens Holy sometimes. Shit. That happens sometimes, you know? That is really funny. That wow, happens. that's funny. But I've had, you know, I've had the fortune, the good fortune of... Never, you never found that guy? Never found him. But I also had a situation where there was somebody hiding under a vehicle in a, in a similar type of business. My dog went in, and now people, you got to understand, as a handler, you got to think of a lot of things when you have a dog. You know, you got to think about the other officers. you got to think about where your dog is. you got to think about tactically how you're being. My dog goes under the vehicle and grabs a guy by the top of the head. That's, you know, those things are bad. You got to be careful of that stuff. You don't want anybody dying from a dog bite. But he was under the car. He didn't come out. You know, the warnings were given. He didn't come out. Maybe he didn't think the dog go underneath that car. But he wound up getting scalped a little bit. Have you ever had your dog shot at? I, had, I didn't stabbed? have him shot at, but I had him stabbed. Um, it's got to be scary. Well, it was scarier to look up at my sergeant, and, and, and he had a cut across his forehead. Uh, it looked like a smile on his head, and all the blood was just... Mm. And his head was shaved, so it didn't make it look any more appetizing. Yeah. But wow. I, I, had, I, I had a couple of close calls. But, you know, also as a handler, I was always very cautious on what I sent my dog in on. You know, you got some guy in a building with a gun. Why would I send my dog in there unless he's got to save the life of somebody else? I'm not going to give his life up. Right. You know, again, it's about the dog. Yeah. Wow. So I, what led you into the dog nutrition? What was the, 
I guess, the switch when you started getting, so you retired and then... Um, I retired in, I actually got my retirement in 2011, but I hadn't been working since April of 06. Mm -hmm. I was on disability. And so after 2011, uh, you sit around for a couple of years and you start feeling like you're dying every day. So right. This is hurting. Oh, I got cancer in the back. I got cancer in the neck. Every ache and pain, you know, you think the worst of it. And so I realized that I had to do something. I had to do something to keep busy. And I've always reverted back to dogs. It's all I knew. Mm -hmm. And so having, having the, the, the experience of the holistic approach through the Goldsteins and, uh, you know, I had, I had, before I retired, I had purchased a farm and uh, I had certainly had space. I was looking for something to do. So I, I just started moving toward an alternative feeding method. And I say that because in all my travels throughout Europe related to dogs, I paid a lot of attention to what went on around me. And most of those little farms and, and the countryside that I traveled on, whether it be in Russia, Slovakia, Holland, it, I always watched the way they fed their dogs. And like, for the most part, it was always farms provided, you know, animal scraps. Mm, yeah. And a lot of bone. A lot of these dogs ate a lot of bone. They, they crap almost pure white from the calcium. Yeah. And so I started along those lines. I, I really didn't even do research. I just went by what I knew the dogs did best on. And I started selling only beef with no other ingredients. Um, really didn't pay much attention to fat content or any of the particular nutritional value. It was just like, you know, being able to give your dog some raw meat with his food. And so um, that it kind of went along pretty much selling beef in one pound bags. It started off selling maybe 500 pounds a month because I knew a lot of dog people. Right. And everybody wanted to come and get a little bit of this. So I used to have um, one pound bags. Just, ham just basically hamburger meat, right? Not ground up so, so small, though. I used to like big chunks because you want a dog. I, I know enough that when a dog chews, he, he produces digestive enzymes. And you want, him to, you want to provide chunks rather than something like ground beef. So it was chunky. And to be more specific, it was ground up in a one-inch plate, which means that each chunk was, was about an inch in diameter. Almost like, like getting a stew? Like, yes, yeah. like stew meat. Yeah. Okay. And um, I was selling it like that, and it went from 500 pounds. I used to go up like once every, every six weeks um, to the slaughterhouse and get 500 pounds. Then it went to 750 pounds. Then it went to 1,000 pounds. Then I started having it in one-pound bags and two-pound bags. And then I went one pound, two pound, and five pound bags. And then before I knew it, it within a year's time, year, year and a half, it was like 3,000 pounds a month that were going out the door. How, how, what, what's the time frame that that went from the 500 pounds to the... I'll be very specific. Once I started getting into the larger amounts, I didn't have freezer space for it all. I had to go. People knew when I was coming home, back with it and they were there to pick it up. Right. It had to go. Supply and demand. <clears throat> And, and I'm going to get into how that turned into something else. Yeah. But then I started really thinking about taking some of the, my retirement savings and investing it into something that would carry through, not only providing me additional income, but I would really get a chance to get into a different phase of my life. You know, I, I was having trouble. I couldn't do any dog training anymore. My One knee was bad. It, it bowed out so bad it looked like uh, I would kick myself in the foot when I walked, in the other foot when I walked. It was like a horseshoe. Oh. And so uh, it was really painful. I was bone on bone in the, in the knee joint. So I couldn't do anything. And, and uh, I, I started delving a little bit more deeper into the nutritional value and and... 
I always knew, like I used to sell dogs. I would bring dogs in from Slovakia. They'd be gone in two weeks. And then three months later, the people would be calling me, hey, this dog looked so great when I got it. And now he looks crappy. His mm. coat isn't shiny. He doesn't have the energy. And it's always, you know, you always got to look back at the diet. You know, what produces the energy? You know, how come your dog's coat's not shiny? And so they learned very quickly that when they went on raw, even if it has no additives, if, even if it's just meat, the shine comes back after about a week. The poop gets small mm -hmm. because they're able to digest more of it. They get more out of it. Their eyes are clear. They're alert. They feel good. And when you feel good, you're more active. Your attitude is different. And, and I recognize this. So I started delving a little bit, educating myself about animal nutrition. And the first thing I thought of were the Goldsteins. So I had gotten it to a certain point, and then I went to Bob Goldstein. And uh, I talked to him about what I was doing. I knew he had already you know, made an attempt to do some health food for dogs. Was he doing raw at all? No. No, not at all. And so it was for me very much like it was for him at the beginning with the holistic. People were so negative, especially veterinarians, about raw. And the worst, in my opinion, and, and my daughter will hear this whenever it airs and she'll be mad at me, but the vet techs were the worst because they only had a little bit of knowledge of what the vet was telling them, and they were telling everyone... Do not feed your dog raw. If you feed your dog raw and then he goes and licks your child, your child can get salmonella and all these crazy things. So, again, like in dog training, I found it was really important to educate people on what you were doing. Simple process. And so I started uh, working up a formula got to a certain point and was not confident enough in myself and my ability. I mean, I knew the meat business. I knew how to handle it. I did research on, on the general diet requirements of dogs, but I wanted something more professional. I wanted something more definite. So I turned to Dr. Bob Goldstein, better known as Dr. Bob. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, was, he was extremely helpful. Um, and made the, the tweaking and, and the initial setup very, very easy for me. And so I started producing what I called complete and balanced diet, only beef. Started providing it for people. And it was, I never did advertising. I never put one ad out about what I was selling. But the product sold itself because people could actually see, and it didn't take a long time, you know, it's not like, hey, look, you do this, and three, four months down the road, you're going to see some difference. Mm. You feed this, and within the first week to 10 days, you will see enough of a difference that you're going to want to come back and buy more. You have to. It's exactly what happened. And all of a sudden, people started asking me, well, what about chicken, and what about this, and how about... And so now, <clears throat> I will fast forward. I mean, we've been... Roganics has been now, I think it's on its 14th year, 13th or 14th year. My daughter is just completing her degree in animal nutrition. The company has grown astronomically. We've got over 200 products. And, I mean, to me, it's a great success story. It's like the end, it's like the final chapter for me. Well, it's a perfect storm for you. It, it worked out that way. Yeah. The only thing is I hope it has a better result than the movie. <laughs> yeah so and that's and that's where where we had met um because my um I, I guess kind of stay in i stay in my lane always you know i don't try to preach about things i don't know i just say you know all my clients are always like tom you're the expert and what do you feed your dogs i'm like i feed raw food and why what's the benefits what's it blah blah, blah. but my experience getting into raw <clears throat> was I had a girlfriend at the time, her and I got St. Bernard's together. She got one, I got one. And uh, he, uh, his, my dog's brother, his name is Lucky, he ended up having really bad hot spots. You bought litter mates? Yeah, yeah. First we mistake. No, we didn't live together. But Oh, okay. Yeah, we were young. We were, I don't even remember. We were, it was, lo it was a long time ago. Uh, 
yeah, a long time ago. You don't have to remember. Yeah. Anyway, so <laughs> he started getting hot spots and licking and licking and licking and licking and licking. And um, this was all locally here in Saratoga. And so she went, she she went to a couple vets, and they're like, "Oh, just here's hot spot spray and um, whatever," and nothing really helped. And um, she, so he was like basically digging himself raw, you know, and it like granuloma. I don't know. Yeah. But it was bad, you know, and so she she kept looking around, and I don't know how she found, but she found. Oh, you know what it was, and I and this it's just crazy, like your the butterfly effect, which we talked about. Is um, she ended up linking up with Chris Dallas in Saratoga, which is a holistic vet, which I ended up I still use to this day. She's wonderful. I'd love to have her on the podcast actually, but she's a holistic vet here in Saratoga. She'd helped me with um, basically the end of life care for my dog who passed away at 18 and she ended up saying like you need first of all anything on the skin uh things like that is typical or ears you know these things are going to be first thing is nutrition like whatever your dog is typically bringing in is what's causing these things i would suggest you just try raw food there's a (laughs) there's a lady named lisa rosamino i know her yeah down yeah yeah so so down exit whatever and this, again, this was uh, 15 years ago or whatever. Mm-hmm. Go talk to her. She has a co-op. And so we go down to this farm, and it was like the day for pickup. When she, uh, my ex-girlfriend at the time, she, she ordered some tubes raw or whatever, and it was pickup time. And we get there, and it's just this farm, and there's just all these things of raw food all over and there's horses and there's people coming to pick it up and we're you know it's just chaotic i'm like what? a little intimidating right yeah i was like what is going on here and i meet lisa and she's super cool i've had her on the podcast way back in the day and um so anyway so she ended up feeding raw and it cleared like that like like you said like within the first week he stopped itching and his hot spots would would be healing scabbing over and hair would grow back and he'd look like he, he looked like he had mange he was so like itching and itching and itching. Yeah, wet and ugly yeah, looking. Wet and ugly and stringy and greenish looking yep. sometimes. Yeah, the right. scab would get green and lick granuloma. Bad. Yeah. So anyway, it it literally within like a week, I'm like, that's pretty cool. You know, all the other vets were like, here's this, here's that, here's the medication, and nothing worked. So she found the raw food. And and I'm a big believer, which I train the way that I think, as I do what works, period. I don't, I don't have an agenda. I don't have tribalistic beliefs and like, oh, I do what works always, mm-hmm. you know, why not? So after that, I said, let me try some of that. <clears throat> so I tried it for my dog and he's the same, he was 145 pounds. He passed away last year. It's 145 pounds, uh, ate four cups a day of kibble, right? So he ate four cups. He pooped four cups. Maybe five. Right. Maybe more. So after like his first meal of raw food, we went out for a walk and he, you know, found his tree and he pooped and I'm like, I'm go to scoop it. And I'm like, look, and I'm like, where's the rest of it? Yeah. You know, you got a dog, a hundred, you know, he's big dog pooping out, you know, huge poops. Right. Yeah. And then all of a sudden it was like scat. Half a hot dog. Yeah, it was like it was like owl pellets. <laughs> spent some time. I spent four summers in and out of Southern Colorado at a wolf sanctuary working with timber wolves, and they used to poop the same. He was pooping, but they also ate everything: elk, horse meat, anything that they can get their hands on raw. And I said, "This looks like wolf poop." And I said, "This is weird." So then, um, just over time. I noticed his coat got a little shinier and things like that, but he was young when he started eating raw. So I didn't see where you see with some dogs where they go from not moving to like the guy off Willy Wonka, like the old grandpa laying in the bed. And we've had, you actually have a client of that story and we'll talk about it in a minute. But so I was hooked. And then that's where, I was like, where, where did you get this stuff? And then we, I came down to your farm probably the first time. I don't know. Again, this is probably 10 years ago or whatever. Um, and then all my other dogs since then had been on it. And I met you. And um, I remember you gave me some soft bones. And one of the overlooked things that I don't know how to tell people, which I hope that you can do, is the soft bones was the only thing that cleaned my dog's teeth. teeth. 
I, so we use the greenies and the, the toothbrushing because periodontal disease in dogs, which is basically gum disease in dogs, is is a very big factor in their overall health and their longevity, right? If they're if they get diseases in their mouth, it, it affects other parts of the body. Of course, to, just like you're, us. you're swallowing disease all day long. So anyway, so when I got the bones and I came home and my dog's teeth started looking better and I was like, this is this is a different and they were raw bones. So I don't know if you can explain to maybe the people listening what these soft bones were it almost seemed like cut femur or something no actually it's not the femur because the femur is a weight-bearing bone and it's got a very thick wall very hard very thick wall and and when you get a a working breed and they start chomping on a femur you'll see that they'll that that bone will shed shards that could be very dangerous not only if the dog swallows it but i mean even eating it it can give them it'll slice the tongue cut the gums so I don't we sell femurs but I don't recommend femurs what I started doing was cutting the pelvic bone the rib cage all the non-weight bearing bones that have a very thin pliable wall and I cut them into four to six inch squares and when the dog the dog is actually able to penetrate the bone not like a femur where he's gnawing at it trying to get at the marrow he can eat the entire piece of pelvic bone or uh, the ribs. I mean, you give the dog a bone and come back half hour later, it's gone. Mm -hmm. So it does a few different things. The only thing people have to watch for when they do feed bones is they have to make sure the dog gets adequate water because when all that bone gets into the digestive tract, it absorbs the moisture. And so you'll see that we call it poop and dust. If the dog's not drinking enough water and he's eating bone, his stools really have to be worked out. I mean, they'll sit there for, you know, mm-hmm. minutes yeah. trying to get them out, and they'll come out breaking apart. So you want to make sure the dog gets enough water, but they're phenomenal. I have gotten so many before and after pictures of dogs' teeth within one week after eating the the, yeah. uh, bo- the soft bones. Yeah. They're clean. They're yeah. white. And that's a and, and you know, that action by a veterinarian when you take a dog in for a teeth cleaning, I don't know if they do it differently now, but you used to have to put the you know, under anesthesia and scale those teeth and everything. That's an expense and, and I never want to put my dog on anesthesia right. when they really don't need it. So this was a much less expensive alternative and I believe it worked better. Yeah. Because you can give a dog one a week, like what I do. I fast my dogs on a Sunday. They don't eat, but they get a bone. So they don't produce digestive enzymes and they don't vomit bile from not eating. It gives the, the, the digestive tract a chance to clear out. Mm-hmm. And they get the, the calcium boost. They get the, t- the calories from the marrow. And they get their teeth cleaned. And they only cost like uh, maybe $35 a box of 20 pounds. It's real cheap. And they're it's great. a good, rem- good remedy. Yeah, they're great. <clears throat> and that's how, so that's my getting into raw food. And then now, so you own Roganics and it's becoming, it has continuing to grow. So now kind of, um, we'll get into the raw food. Uh, well, uh, let's just dive into that now. So <clears throat> let's just say, okay, um, raw food for people is... I'm sorry, raw meat uh, for people is typically, you know, not good for you depending on what you eat and stuff like that. But one thing I, my, in my dog professional career that kept kind of resurfacing was raw food and raw diet. And the more, I call them OGs, working dog people, you know, the, the people who were really in it, not pet owners, the, the dog people. Diehards. Yeah, the people who really were, in it. Mm-hmm. They were all doing raw. So <clears throat> I got my duchy from a lady. She's, she didn't, I, she basically said, Hey, I got this washout military dog. He's a two year old duchy from, um, I don't know, some, some K and PV line, whatever. And she, she's just an old school. Like she's been working with dogs and horses her whole life. You know, she's been doing it longer than I well past I've been alive and so she said I got this duchy 
I have two duchies. I have a female and I have this male. Could he come up and help me train? And this was when I was early on in my training career. And I said, yeah, sure. Um, not too familiar with the breed, but I really want to get a working dog for my demo dog for my career. And I remember going up there and I worked with, it was just a, you know, I was kind of, it was like the first time I was scared. I was like, you know, cause everyone kind of hyped up these duchies and these Malinois as like, oh, you know, and you're like, they're just, they're, they're you know, they're, they're, they're not what they're. Anyway, I went up there, <clears throat> I did some training and she said, Hey, I, this has been great. And that was cool for me to hear. This is a lady that's been working with working dogs well over 30 years. She complimented you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I was like, wow, that's kind of cool. We all like compliments. Yeah. <laughs> so she um, she said, I can't really pay you for your services past, you know, this. She was on disability and whatever. And um, I said, okay, that's fine, you know. And she said, but I said, I, if you want, are you interested in a puppy? And I said, yeah, I'm actually looking for a demo dog. She said, I, I'm planning on breeding these two. I think they would be good. And she had like the old school duchy lines where it was more blonde. And I can't remember the Peggy ain't, Peggy something or other. So she ended up breeding these two dogs. She said, I'll give you pick of the litter for your services. You come around until the dogs are born. That's and a good I'll, deal. Yeah. I was like, That's sure. Good deal. So I did that. But going back to Raw, she said, can you help me feed them? I said, sure. So she said, here. She handed me this whole, um, it was a chicken thigh, mm-hmm. right? whole chicken thigh bone in bone in yeah she goes here go give this to him i said a raw chicken yeah yeah the raw chicken i go the i was so confused i'm like it was it was thawed out and just hanging there you know nice big lunk yes yeah yeah Yeah. and she just gets him down at the price right and bulk freezes him she she thawed it out and she said here and i said well what do you but this is what i mean is like this is what taught me the dog culture and dog culture to me is why I'm on this mission, especially with I, when I do podcasts and I do different types of documentary-esque type videos um, on my YouTube channel is the dog culture needs to be explored more because other people would understand their dogs more if they were introduced to people like yourself. So she, she gave me this thing and I said, well, what do I do? She said, just go give, just go throw it to him. Like, I'm like thinking like a cartoon, like just, so she said, yeah. So, so I'm sitting there and there's this working line intact, like, you know, and his tail's just doing this. He's licking his chops. I'm like, just, just give it to him. She goes, yeah, but just be be, be careful. And I start to kind of open the door and this dog's just coming at me, you know, hitting, hitting the door. He knows what's coming. And I'm like, holy shit, this is crazy. And I'm seeing this dog, like for the first time, he, he really was like, his drive peaked before that. He was just, I think being polite to me so i just threw it to him and he just went over there and he's sitting there looking at me just crushing this heaven yeah and before i left it was gone and i'm and it's rolling in the dirt and it's getting all that and the grass tasty exactly and it just on it it just taught me like i'm like this is real dog culture like this is this is it you know what i don't get look all these commercial foods even raw they talk about the wild. Even I mean, they even go into naming their food about the wild. Yeah. Okay? Well, damn it. If you want everything natural, why would you feed your dog kibble? I like to make it as natural as possible. You want to you wanna emulate the wolf's diet? Listen, we can get it as close as we can get it, but... The fact is the dog is domesticated, so you don't really want him to have a wolf's diet. Mm -hmm. But the raw, you can give your dog big chunks of raw meat where he has to put it in his mouth. Like I have clients who buy chicken parts and and they get big chunks of beef and they get a couple of uh, chicken feet, maybe a turkey neck, um... A, a, they'll whack off a hunk of liver and throw it in there. So the animal actually has to get it like a wolf would and get it into the back teeth, not using the front teeth, right. getting it into the back and really chomping down on it. I mean, this is, so then it starts producing more enzymes, digestive enzymes. This all works the way the body is supposed to work. It's the best way to do it. So the rougher you are at it, Throw it down. Give it to them. Let them have it. They get the most out of it. And it's... So from the average, and again, I, I have a good insight of the... Pet, I'm a pet owner myself, you know, with a really good observation of um, reality. 
So I think one of the things that people would be afraid of is choking. So like if they're chewing up, well, two things is they say, well, it's, it's raw. So isn't that bad form? And what about the bone? What, are, wh what do you say about that? Okay, as long as the bone is not cooked, it's perfectly fine. It's not going to splinter. Again, like I explained, the femur bones, those will splinter. But a chicken bone we're talking about specifically now, it's a soft bone. It's very pliable. It's got all those great tendons attached to it. And so the dog will have no problem with it. Now, so when somebody says to me, raw chicken, hey, when I was a kid, I lived in the city. You know how many dogs I looked at? eating food in the hot summer out of a garbage pail, flies and maggots on it, and that dog would be chomping down on that old meat that's sitting in there. They were perfectly happy. They didn't have a vet to take care of them. They're, they were there every day for years, the same dumpster, eating the same crap out of it. Yeah. They have a different digestive tract. Their, their digestive enzymes and their, their stomach acid is so... It's like battery acid. Different sure, than us. They're much different than us. You know, then if you want to become technical, yeah, you know, you got to worry about parasites and stuff. But there are alternatives much simpler to, you know, to, to introduce to take care of parasites than would be harmful, such as feeding your dog kibble. I mean, if you, like for us, we manufacture um, a product. They call it Frank's Ticked Off. Because I'm ticked off about something every day. <laughs> so they call it Frank's Ticked Off, and it was actually developed because of ticks and fleas. And so it's got a base of, of, uh, br of um, excuse me, garlic. It smells like garlic. I know that. It's got a base of garlic. It's got bruised yeast. And everybody says, oh, you can't give a dog yeast. Well, it's all dead. It's all dead anyway, the, the yeast uh, cultures. And so a little bit of bruised yeast and then a couple of... Uh, other additives that I can't divulge. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I needed something that will transport all the stuff to the skin so that this emanates through the skin and it becomes a preventative. So while you're getting rid of ticks and fleas, by accident, with the same ingredients, I'm also, and I learned this after the product was made, I'm also protecting against internal parasites. Hooks, whips, tape, Worms. Worms. Uh, and so this one product covered, uh, you know, a variety of issues. So it's a lot easier doing that than not feeding your dog raw because of obvious reasons. What's the, what's the biggest benefit to feed your dog raw compared to kibble? And, and I know that this is probably mundane for you at this point, but if, if people are out there listening and they're saying, okay, um, all right, raw food, cool. And when we talk about raw food, it would be this, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, and I'm not making a statement here, I'm asking. Um, when when we're talking about raw food, it, it just means that it's it's all the, when, when you cook stuff, like it's it, same thing with like raw vegetables, right? Raw minerals, raw, the raw, it's, it's in the raw. It's not being taken You out. cook out the best of what you want if, if you cook it. So when you feed kibble, um, huge industry, right? I mean, obviously. Very huge. So what's the biggest, you know, keynotes that you would say, like, look, okay, here's what raw food at scale is, is why it's better. Okay. I mean, obviously, it's more natural. It's made, I mean, dogs genetically are made to eat raw, something raw. They get their, they get their nutrition from a raw diet. So if you want to revert back to the wild, I don't care if a, dog, if a wolf is out there and, and grabs a rabbit, it grabs a bird, the bird eats seeds off the, tr off the, the grass, so you're getting, you're getting some, nutri some veg vegetable nutrition, you know, or, or a rabbit is eating leaves and it's eating sh grubs and stuff like that. So if you, if you go back to kibble and you, and you look intricately into what it's comprised of. The best advice I give to customers who call me and question it, I, I ask them if they're a member of, uh, of Netflix, because if they have Netflix, there's a documentary. It's called Dog Fooled, mm -hmm. but they, they, they move the letters around so it looks like dog food, but it's, the name of the, of the, the video was Dog Food. A dog fooled. Yeah. 
And it will show you the entire process of how kibble is made from incorporating the use of dead animals. Um, it was pro it's produced primarily because during World War I, they needed something that they can package for, for pets that was not in metal cans. They needed the metal, they needed the steel. And so they produced something, instead of making the nutritional value the primary objective, they produced something that could be put in a paper bag and not leak through. Wow. And so that's what they got. Now there's a, you know, like some people come to me and they say, oh, we use the high quality kibble. Well, I mean, that's really good, but that's like having, uh, you know, cancer that's not really frightening. It's, it's still crap. It's still terrible. It's, it's not for them. And the reason, I went as far as, and I had a laugh when you were talking before about you give your dog four cups of kibble and it shits out four cups, and I said maybe five. You know what I did for a customer one time? She was a real hard sell. Didn't want, you know, the vet said don't use it. Her friend said don't use it. I said, I'll tell you what. Go buy a 20-pound bag of whatever dog food you use. Empty the bag into a pail and keep the bag. Feed your dog every day out of that pail. And when it shits, put it back in the bag that the food came in. And when you're done, I want you to weigh the bag. It was three pounds heavier. Now, maybe she got a couple of rocks and stuff in there when she picked it up. But it was heavier from the poop than it was when it was full of kibble. Mm -hmm. It doesn't keep it. it it doesn't retain any of it. It gives it just enough nutrition to get by. It's like eating corn every day. Yeah. For humans, right? Yeah, you're just still in the kernel. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Like eating flaxseed instead of eating crushed flaxseed. Yeah. You don't, you don't get past the kernel. You don't, you don't get the nutritional value. So I don't know if I'm too far away. It seemed like it was echoing. You're good. Um, if you need to move it, go no, ahead. No, I'm cool. So um, nutritionally... You want to stay on track. So the biggest thing, to get back to your question, the biggest thing that I would say you take away from it, if you really love your dog, wellness. The wellness and longevity of your dog. Because they live longer. That life is less troubled with different types of reoccurring infections in the ears. Look, it's not a cure-all. Dogs get cancer when they're on raw, you know? Uh... But, you know, crappy things happen to dogs, even though they eat raw, but so few and far between in comparison. Also, and I believe, and this may be a little selfishness on my part, but I believe that a lot of the contradiction and a lot of the issue against raw being no good is because there's a lot of veterinarians who paid a lot of money for a, an education that... Raw diets will cut into. Your dog does not have to go to the vet as much. Mm. It's, it's, you know, it's not anything to be hidden. It's the fact. You eliminate a lot of these minor issues right off the get-go. Like what? Like hot spots. Like reoccurring ear infections. Mm. Um, like chewing on the toes and, and licking. And, and, you know, a little bit of an allergy. The dog starts to lick. All of a sudden, from it being wet, you wind up with a hot spot or a lick granuloma. The longer it goes, the uglier it gets. You start losing hair from, the, from that spot. You bring your dog to the vet. Well, the vet says, does your dog have all of its shots? Which is another topic you want to talk to me about someday. <laughs> so I tell people, you go on raw. Just try it. I hate to say how much I gave away at the, on the early years. Here, take 50 pounds. If, it, if, if you don't come back, it, you don't pay anything. Yeah. Try it. Everybody came back. Not one person didn't come back. And I've had people that started on it and then said, I can't use it anymore. Okay, was there a problem with it? Or, or did your dog have a problem? No. My vet said he won't, he won't take care of the dog if I keep it on raw. Abby, can you throw me my phone? I want to show you this. There's a, there's a picture that my... Mom had sent me that she, she recently went to the vet 
And there's this, I want to read that. I don't, to be honest, I didn't read it. I have no idea what it says, but I want to, I want to read it to you and see what you think about it because I know it had something to do with raw food. And I go, oh, I'm going to read this to Frank when I see him. So, and this is no, you know, I, I don't know anything about the vet or anything like that. I just, I know that she had sent this to me because it was on the door, like it says right here, scientists confirm the harm in feeding raw pet foods by Amanda Carrazzo. Incorporating raw meat into the diet in comparison to animals has always been widely debated. Proponents argue that raw foods provide nutritional value that can't be achieved through kibble, promote healthier digestion, and reduce periodontal disease. Critics include the FDA denying such benefits and warn raw pet foods to expose animals to bacterial infection. Several raw food pet products have been recalled in recent months due to potential blah, 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 blah. So this is just another thing, you know, in the thing. So other than there's got to be more than just them trying to make more money. The vets. It, do you think it's also just education? Oh, I don't think they're trying to make more money. I think, I think that, like all of us, they need to pay the bills. You know, I think that when I'm not going to get in, into the into the governmental aspect of it because the FDA. You mean the FDA and and I think education is is important and. You know, about introducing your dog to all these different new bacterias. Dogs eat their own shit. Come on. I mean, what, are you kidding me? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, let's be realistic. It's about, it all comes down to the Benjamins. That's where we're at in this world. Well, and Science Diet is pumping the vets. That's paying the rent. With red. food. It's, yeah. it's Listen, the- every sponsor is either Purina, Science Diet, Royal Canin. Look, look we all do what we need to do. However... I'm not saying that that it's bad, but it's bad for the dog. Yeah. And so right now, Rawganics, you guys have over 200 products. And um, one thing that I've been I've been ordering from you for, I don't know, I, I would say close to, well, Lakota's seven now. She's been on it since she'll probably be seven or eight years. I was going to say at least... You've been. I know you're coming down. I was going to say at least five or six years. Yeah, so maybe I'm off a little bit. Yeah, a little bit more because we've been feeding it with Lakota since she was a puppy. But my Saint Bernard Thompson lived till he was 12, which is old for a large breed Saint dog. Saint Bernard. Yeah, and orthopedically, he was so well. Oh yeah. Because because of his diet and just hi- historically, dogs that size don't live that long with a good quality of health. And what ended up with him is he unfortunately had um, pneumonia, which then kind of hung on because of his age. And then he, his appetite was kind of iffy, and then he ended up getting bloat and, and then whatever. But orthopedically, he was so well um, intact with everything. Lean muscle mass. He probably didn't get overweight. Right. You know, that's another thing. You know, it's much easier to maintain weight in an elderly dog feeding raw than than kibble and you know i know they have a lot of different and and since raw has become more popular kibble companies have started producing more um breed specific or age specific products which may be better for dogs than the the run in the mill crap but it's still kibble it's still it's it's cooked out everything good right and to boot now with raw, they are uh, they're interjecting things that I personally I don't like, but you know you have to follow the law. You know, um, with HPP raw, with raw food. You mean yes, yeah. yeah. HPP, it's high pressure pasture high pressure pasteurization. Yeah. So it's almost like you know putting your meat in the washing machine before you give it to your dog. Yeah. It, but but you have to do it in you order have, to, to you s- have to meet ethical standards. Yeah. You know, uh, but it's still better than kibble by a long shot. Yeah. Now you you mentioned the age of your dog. I lost one last year. Um, not the dog I was talking about earlier. His name is Bricks. His son, who I named Bricks, I had to. Dutchie Malinois. Uh, Malinois, and he was twenty years. He was two months shy of twenty years old. Whoa. However, he died in July, last uh, two years ago. He died in July. 
The October before, my wife videoed me taking some bites off him. I mean, and this dog was into it. He came yeah, alive at 19 yeah. years old. You're still fighting me good. Yeah. But at the end, we were both knocked out. But <laughs> Yeah. My, my older dog, who lived until she was 18, I, 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 had, I again, like you can say all you want about raw dog. And that's the thing is like I'm not going to say – what you have to do, I'm not. I'm not even going to say what you should do. I just say, and and I'm like this w- w- from a training standpoint too. Is I say, here's what's worked for me. Do what works. And my thousands of, you know, and as I continue to grow, I think the message becomes more validated because it's it's like, okay, it worked for this person and this person and this person, and then just go right. So she was 18, and then. Until, her, until we put her down, the day that we put her down, she couldn't really get up and walk on her own, but she'd eat her raw food. And typically, dogs who are on their way out, one of the things that kind of like nails the, the nail in the coffin, if you will, is their diet. Appetite. Exactly. For sure. And, and that's one thing that it was so hard for me almost because I, every day I'd put that raw food in that bowl and she'd go and she'd just gobble it up. And that was amazing to me and my and Chris Dallas, my vet, because it, it's one of those things that it, the dog's like, all right, here we go. I'm going to eat this. And then uh, towards the end of their life, they're like, screw this. I'm done with this. That gives you a little indication, too. And, yeah. and when they're eating raw, it's hard. That indication becomes more difficult. Yeah. And do you remember that um, there was the, the uh, her husband is a doctor. They live right over by my other facility. She's a, she's from England. She's a client of mine. Yes, absolutely. Oh, I, I can't remember. Her name. So, 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 really lovely. Delivered to her. Yes, still t- today. Really lovely, and um, they live Boston Spa. Yeah, yeah. They're over by her other facility. I did some work for them, and she's really lovely. And they, I think they have another younger shepherd that I worked with at the time. He's probably not young anymore. And I'm very I, big. Yeah, very mm-hmm. large dog. Yeah, yes. and I, I can't imagine the older one's still around. But I remember she told me the story. Because she got linked up. I don't know. We got either, uh, whatever. But they, they, they were feeding your food. And um, she said, yeah, the, the older dog, because I, I said, man, the older dog, the older shepherd's moving around good. She said, well, um, she, she wasn't, or he wasn't, or whatever. He said, um, the dog was pretty much decrepit and kind of ending. Very the, angulated. Yes. And they switched to raw food, and she said the dog gets up and runs in the fields. And that, to me, was like, damn. Do you remember that? Absolutely. That's insane. Absolutely. Very nice lady. And I'm, I'm really sorry I can't remember her name. Yeah, she's really nice. But she had that dog that really couldn't get around. And she said after she switched diets from kibble to raw. Changed it all. Yeah, it was unbelievable. And on a personal note. I can't even explain the feeling that one gets from providing a product right. that, damn it, I don't care what anybody says. It makes a difference. It's a difference. The dog has, the dog has a better day. The dog has a better life. And, in, and just for me, I'm, I'm like a brick and mortar guy. I'm like, take it day by day. If you have a better day, you have a better, you know, blah, blah, blah. So... So if somebody's out there, and, and right now, um, I know, so raw organics, I get, um, one good thing about, another thing about, and I'm not just trying to say go on raw food, I'm just trying to trying to figure out, um, I guess, journalistically, if that's, a, if that's a word, trying to figure out and pull out the information of why it's good. And so it's good because it's a natural diet for the dog, so their body knows what to do with it. They have all of that um, acid in their, in their intestines, in their stomach, to be able to break it down. And then when you feed kibble, it, it's not – the body's probably like, what is this? Like this this is just this going – This is all we got. It's going out the back door, right? So uh, one, one other thing I want to ask – well, not one other thing, but one of the things I want to ask you is one thing that I find interesting – Two, actually two things before I forget. <laughs> this is, this is going to probably make you laugh. But the first thing is why – why, why do you feed less raw food than kibble? So I know like with my, again, my St. Bernard, I think he was on, I can't remember exactly, but Lakota, my Dutchie, she's on a pound um, twice a day. So she's got two pounds a day, but like kibble, I'd have to give her more than that in the mm-hmm. bowl. So why does, why do you have to give less raw food than you would kibble? Okay. My daughter's probably the better one to answer that question, but I'm going to answer it for you. In my opinion, 
I would say that the dog is the dog's digestive system is more capable of extracting more nutrition from the raw than it is from the kibble. Okay, so, so getting okay. Okay, so yeah. it's getting nutritionally it's getting more from less. So rule of thumb and this is scientifically developed. Rule of thumb is 2.5% of a dog's body weight daily. So a 100-pound dog, being the mathematician I am, mm -hmm. it's going to take two and a half pounds of meat. Mm -hmm. So our product consists of 80% muscle meat, 10% ground bone, and 10% organ. That's all in a complete and balanced product along with all the other vitamins, minerals. We have four varieties of live probiotics in the, in the complete and balanced diet. And that also, I get that. I get the complete with you guys. That also comes with veggies. We make it both, with and without veggies. Now, the nutritional value of veggies, it does contribute, but not a great extent. Not as much as meat. N nowhere near. And, and on, a, on a really upfront note, in my personal opinion, it does contribute, but is not necessary. Mm -hmm. I sure. like, ha you know, I, I like putting, like, now we're starting to, uh, we have a whole line of treats. We're starting to dehydrate sweet potato, pumpkin, different things beef like. Beef liver? Oh, we have beef liver already. Beef liver, chicken hearts, chicken liver. Uh, you know, uh, we have, we slice we slice um, like large pieces of beef, chicken breast, turkey breast. They're sliced like a potato chip and dehydrated. The treats are phenomenal. Yeah, I, I the use treats um, are phenomenal. I don't have any in here, but one thing I haven't been able to really resource myself and, and brand and sell because everyone's always like, "What do you?" I got my own treat pouch. I got my own e collar. I yeah. got my own leash. Is uh, I use Stewart's Pro Treats. Uh, dehydrated um beef liver and it's the because it's sing, first of all it's single ingredient it's got good protein uh and it, the dogs love it now let me plug my product okay all of our all of our treats are single ingredient that's number one number two and i would i would just err on a little bit of caution when you use heart for your treats chicken heart beef heart turkey heart, keep in mind that they're about 60, 65% protein. So you could really, if you're given a lot of treats during right. the day, you can really up the protein level, which is not good for the kidney. So just be aware of that if you're using the heart. But, um, you know, we dehydrate liver. Um, like one of our products that Frank's ticked off, when I first came out with it, we were having difficulty because you put it in the dog's food and they didn't want to eat it anymore. It had a bitter taste. Yeah. Because we had to, um, what we did was we uh, dehydrated pork liver and put a little bit of pork liver in there. Now watch out, they'll eat it out of the bag without taking it out of the bag. And to give, to give uh, context for people who are listening and watching, the Frank's Ticked Off is basically a powder form, um, like, you, like you were saying earlier, tick repellent, uh, all of the, all that stuff that you would use, see from like a Soresto. It's just more natural. I think the only downfall to Frank's ticked off, which is why I'm not, I have some at my house, mm -hmm. which is I'm not consistent with it, is you have to do it every, so it's just scoop that you put into the food. It, and do it, you distribute that nationally or just locally? Because um, you got to be careful. It maybe it, it, it's, it's, it's local, but, it, you know, we may ship out a little bit nationally. Like we have some people who, who ask us to mail it to them. Yeah, it's good so stuff. We mail it we mail it all over. Now I'll tell you something since we're on that. Right now there's a big problem going on with ticks because they've become I don't want to say completely immune, but they're not even working with Soresto collars or our vet my wife's dog had to go two or three times now. Bad case of limes. Yeah. And he was telling us how with his clients, you know, they're on a couple of different front line and all the stuff a couple of different types of tick prevention and none of it's working wow because they're you know it's almost i guess like the rats in new york city they become immune to the poisons after a while they, yeah. you know they and they get past it so only takes one so the 
the the the Frank's ticked off is just that powder. Um, right. And then right now, so I get duck from you guys. I get beef from you guys. I get chicken from you guys. Or I don't get duck anymore because you guys no, don't have we, duck. No, we stopped the duck. But I, I do get the R75 mix. Mm-hmm. Um, and it comes in, uh, and I'm giving people, because some people out there are like, okay, this this raw food sounds great. What does it look like? What does it taste like for the dogs? What does it smell like? And, and I just want to give people a picture of how easy raw food has been for me. Uh, and I work with a company now that does sh- uh, ship uh, nationally um, in the United States right to your door called We Feed Raw. And they have, they package it up and it, boom, they give it right to you. And like you were saying before, um, just pretty much any raw diet is going to be better than the imes that they're giving their dog. Not a doubt. So uh, it's, 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 it's the same thing with We Feed Raw. What you do is you, you freeze it at a ridiculously low uh, what's the temperature like negative 45 or something crazy 65 yeah because that deep freezes it but also kills all the all the um, bad potential parasites any any parasites because yeah. the bacteria is good some yeah some bacteria is good but this when when you blast freeze it negative 65 you, Fahrenheit yeah you uh, you take care of the potential hazards of parasites so and then when I get like your product or we feed raw, it's it's it's, um, it's it's already frozen, and you you do you still do the patties? Oh yeah, yeah. So you, so you do eight ounce patties, four ounce, four ounce patties, and we do in some in some of the product we do make what we call nuggets. It's a one point five ounce, looks like a, uh, I don't know, maybe. marshmallow. Like a marshmallow. That's exactly what it looks like. There Let me go. tell you the story because I knew I was going to forget and I I did forget. Okay, <laughs> this is nuts, and I've, I may have talked about this in the podcast before. Okay, so raw food is not only good for dogs, but it's good for cats. Okay, so my cat, Pip, uh, he's 13 probably now, which not, is not super old for a cat. Uh, it's, you know, it's an older cat, but not some of them live 20, whatever. So he was eating, he was obsessed with Friskies, just to... Corn and sugar. That's what they like. Right? Like kids. Yes. So we were feeding the friskies out of the blue bag, and he was obsessed with it and everything. We started feeding, and, you know, cats. I'm, like, I'm thinking, like, okay, raw food for cats. It's probably not going to take much to feed him. You know, I had the same. I had three dogs I was feeding raw, right? I, I had the, you know. So anyway, it was a lot, it was a lot of money. It was a lot of freezer space. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, it was a lot of logistics, you know, going to get it. That's why, you know, it was Frank. It was so hard for me when people, I would say, raw, I would just just die in the store for raw food because it changed my life. It gave me more years with my dog, which you can't pay for Absolutely. unless you get raw food. <laughs> I agree. Right? So I just said, look, you know, I've had clients. It's not just me. It's my clients. It's other people. It's people who really enjoy raw food, and, and, and it extends the life of the dog, which is invaluable. I mean, it's just, it's just it's your best friend. And in some cases, it's your it's your canine off handler it's a partner it's, it's everything For exactly sure. your partner so anyway so he's eating friskies and i said well frank you got um you got the uh, raw food for cats you said yeah i got cat nuggets i said okay let, let me try a box well we gave him did i ever tell you this no <laughs> <laughs> my wife oh she's anyway i'll tell you we gave him the box of um or we gave him the two cat nuggets and he wouldn't eat it so he went probably a week without eating and I was like, oh, man, like, he's not going to eat it. I just have all this cat nuggets. What am I going to do? And I'm not sure the difference between the cat nuggets and whatever, but. I'll explain it to you later. Okay. Go so ahead. so I said, okay, he's not going to eat this. So I, shit. So then after like the sixth day, he finally was like, and I wouldn't leave it down. I would pick it up, put it back, leave it, you know. Mm-hmm. So I'd put it down again. I'd try it again. Just like, just like a puppy that wasn't eaten. I said, okay, it's gone until next time, right? Because it teaches them and encourages them. Like, you can't just. You discard it. Yeah, it's you got to eat it once it's there. Even we know when it'll be back. Yeah, exactly. We got shit to do. So anyway, he started eating it, and then he just turned into a monster. He was like, meow, 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 meow. And I'm not kidding you. To this day, to this very day, and it's kind of like a, it's a thing now in my house where it's like, you don't have to worry about my dog taking your cheeseburger <laughs> or anything off the counter. They're carnivores. This cat after feeding raw food, turned into an absolute savage. And I don't know if it was like, 
what is this? I don't have to Why kill. Why did I wait so long? I don't have to. Taste to it. Yeah, ex- exactly. I don't have to kill the chipmunk for this. I don't have to kill the squirrel or the rabbit for this because these, you know, cats are yeah. savages. They kill more things in the United States than a lot of things. And people don't realize that they're savages. So he changed from being this cute little kind of like house cat to a savage. And right now he'll get up on the counter and st- he'll take your bagel off the th- and run away with it and eat it because he just he. I think he went from. There's something else out there. After we fed him raw, it was like a movie. He turned into a werewolf or something. <laughs> he completely changed. And I'm, and my wife is like losing her mind because he will literally, like I have a 10-month-old now, uh, human. Oh, congratulations. Thank you. I didn't he, know. Yeah. He'll literally like go up and she'll be like feeding him like little chicken strips or something, you know, and he's just chewing on it and the cat will be there trying to take trying it to out of his him. hand and the other day he caught banks is my son's name caught him and he started crying and all. he's an absolute savage and it's so interesting how we went from being obsessed with the eating his little scoop of friskies hitting the bowl now every morning 5 a.m he's outside of our door meow, meow. we have to put him in the basement like when we were like, oh man, I don't want to wake up at five tomorrow or whatever. We have to put him in the basement. And then when we, again, like I, I've had three dogs, sometimes more in my house at a time. My dogs are always trained. Obviously, we never have to worry about them. You put your, you eat your breakfast and you turn away and it's good. You, you don't, don't touch it. You don't have to worry about that. But my cat, he'll be up there eyeing it and he'll come up and like, like, I'm not even kidding, like a ferocious prey driven animal, come up, grab it and run, a, run away with it. And he's done it with breasts of chicken and steak and it's crazy how many times was i cursed i i can't every day it's this thing it's this constant thing with this cat and i don't know why the other thing i want to mention do you remember the time that i called you and i said frank um i got this client that really wants to switch to raw food and uh, he just needs more information about it. And I don't really know what to tell him because it's the same thing why I wanted to have you on this podcast. I'm like, I want you to just tell people why it's good. And if they're interested, here's how to do it, which we'll get into next about like people want to mm-hmm. go home and do it. They can or they can find your stuff or whatever. But I remember I called you and I said, hey, I got this client that really wants um, to to get into raw food. I'm not sure how and why and when. And you said, oh, well, just uh, tell them uh, – um, tell him this and tell him that. And I said, okay. And then I went and I told him. And then I remember <laughs> I, uh, I call, I, I called you and I said, Frank, um, I got the client on the other line and he's, he's feeding his dog pork. Is that okay? And you're like, no, you don't want to do pork. And I go, can I put you on three way with him? And you're like, sure. I'm like, it's the governor Cuomo. Oh, <laughs> and you go, uh, yeah, sure. And I remember you were probably like waking up, drinking coffee, not expecting you're about to get three-wayed with the governor of the entire state of New York. But I remember sitting there, and, and, and Governor Cuomo used to call me. He still calls me. His, his dog is here every other – all the time. So – and uh, I've always had good experiences with him besides the politics. I don't really give a shit. So he said – um, hey, you know, you know, he's a big yeah. Italian guy. He, Tom, I, you know, he's like, I don't – you know, and I said, uh, I said, well, I got a guy that – can tell you and I'm and I go can I put you on hold governor he's like he's probably not used to that right I was probably the only person in the state that told him I'm gonna put I'm gonna you, put you on hold put you on hold because when they when his office would call over to me it was very like hey Tom governor's on the line you have time I'm like yeah sure no problem whatever I said let me put you on hold <laughs> and I'm thinking back on this I'm like holy shit so then I called Frank I go man I hope Frank answers you know hey Tom are you I said hey I got the guy on the other line could you talk to him I'm like it's Governor Cuomo and you're like sure and it was so cool because you didn't miss a beat you were like and you went right into it because I think that would kind of frazzle some people they're like oh, okay so it was well, nice I appreciate that I'm going to tell you something funny because you reminded me of it when I started this company I used my personal cell phone as the number to call. People want, you know, you got to get in touch with me here. Call me. Sure. You know, here I am now, 12, 14 years later. I, sometimes I got to throw that phone because it just never stops. Even though we've transferred everything and, you know, the company's a big company now. It's got its own phones and this and that. Mm-hmm. People still call on that line. and That's me. I do that. Well, I, you know, <laughs> I answer it when I can, but, you know, I'm so tied into things that you got a, a phone in your back pocket. You just don't hear. You're sitting on a tractor or something, you know, you, you just don't get a chance to hear it. So it automatically trans- over, transfers over to the office. But 
I want to say something about your cat and the cat food. Mm -hmm. Please. The way it's different is, first of all, the bone is finer ground. And cats require more taurine. 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 Uh, the body produces, you know, the cat produces some, but not enough. Dogs require a little bit too, but the cat requires more. So it has a very similar um, nutritional value, but it's got a higher taurine level. And the, and the, uh, the bone is like toothpaste in it. You don't get, you know, it's, it's finer ground. And the meat is finer ground. Yeah. Because if you Notice give a dog that. the cat pellets you'll, or, or the, the cat food, you'll see they'll lap it more than chew it. That, yep. And that's what I wanted to prevent. I don't want the dog to lap it up his food. I yep. want him to chew it. That's where he gets the benefit of producing those enzymes. Yeah. Pavlov's theory of conditioned response. Yeah. So. Well, that, yeah, whatever you did with the cat nuggets. My it wife, worked. My wife's not happy. <laughs> my, my cat is real happy. My wife is very happy because we have an older cat born with that missing one foot. Hmm. And when he doesn't get it, and that really angers me. Like if, if I forget to leave his food before we go to bed, my wife gets woken up consistently. He'll lick her hair. He'll rip the, mm -hmm. the, out of the out of the the bathroom waste basket. He'll start licking the, the yeah. bag, and he gets crazy, crazy. And he, you know, this angry little rumble. But uh, put it down, and he and he, also he's an older cat. And I'll tell I'll tell you, listeners, if you have an older cat that really has digestive issues, it makes it so much easier. To feed raw for the cat, it, for the cat to digest that is so much easier than this kibble. It will make him eat more. He'll feel better. He'll digest yeah. it easier. And a tip to you: if your cat gives you trouble eating some of this, would you just feed him intact, like w w put that little nugget in a in a bowl? Because there's nothing wrong with taking an extra minute, crushing it, adding a little bit of warm water, mixing it around a little bit to make it like a um, a smoothie. Like a soft, soft. Yeah, like a little smoothie because the older cats, they like, they like it easy, you know. They like to uh, yeah. they like to lick it and push their face in it. And yeah, he, yeah. Mm. But boy, he, now this cat, he, he got a little quaff on him now. He yeah. started eating that stuff and he's looking good. Yeah. So um, I want to get into some questions some people had asked. Sure. Um, what, uh, so I know one of the questions that people are going to ask and I, and I want to help people on this is, okay, if they're interested in raw and, and they're going to do their own research and whatever, um, but, uh, you know, as an expert and obviously you being an expert, and how, how long have you been working with dogs? 52, 53 okay. years, yeah, 55, 50 to 55 years. Yeah. So you're m more than an expert, right? So, and it's, it's your business, it's your livelihood, it's your passion, right? So, um, I, I, two things is, um, if, if somebody wants to transfer to raw food, they're like, okay, I get it. I got it. Right. How how would they successfully do that? Like, the, uh, meaning, like, if, if they went with, like, We Feed Raw, or company that I worked with, or if they found somebody like you that's more local that does their own raw food, you, you don't suggest just going out and getting it, putting it down, right? Do you, do you mix it? Do, how do you... Okay, remember what I said earlier. You never mix it. Ever. You just, Ever. you go right to raw. Well, you don't have to go right to raw, but you don't mix the raw with the kibble because that's going to create issues in digestion what you want to do is you feed your regular stuff at the mo in the morning Kibble, right and you feed your your meat product as a separate meal in the evening yeah you do that for two or three days and then you start feeding less of the kibble and more of the raw over a period of a week you will be onto the raw completely right now like everything else with dogs it varies from dog to dog any dog that I've ever changed over, I stopped feeding the raw, uh, the, the kibble, and went right to raw, and I never had a problem. But again, these are all working dogs. If you've got a you know, King Charles Cavalier Spaniel or a little Yorkie, right. it may be a little bit different. That's what my mom just had a problem with. <clears throat> I gave her a little bit of raw to use for her. Uh, she has a 16-year-old Shih Tzu mm -hmm. that probably ate junk her mm -hmm. whole life, and she had diarrhea. And she said, what? You know, she had diarrhea. She, well, she said she wasn't eating. So I said, we'll try raw food. I've never met a dog that wouldn't lap up raw food, especially if they're coming from kibble, mm -hmm. right? That's like eating Burger King every night to go into a Michelin star restaurant. It's like, this is different. Usually. So she said, yeah, she ate it, but she had diarrhea. Mm -hmm. uh, that's probably common for... I would, I would think it, would be, it wouldn't be anything that would alarm me. I would just continue on that course. 
Okay. Yeah, I mean, you don't want the dog to, con you know, to go on with, a, with diarrhea, but you also have to, the meat that she gave her, did it have bone in it? Because if you give just I'm meat. I'm not sure. Yeah, if you give just meat, you, you will have a problem with, with a loose bowel. Okay. And what, um, so like, so what's the process that you have right now? Because you have a farm, right? How yeah. big's your farm? Well, we've got three farms actually, but um, all combined in Dutchess County, uh, 20, uh, around 60 acres. Yeah, it's not small. 60, 70 acres. Is your, is your farms for your livestock, for your food? Or how, do you go to the slaughterhouse? How it used to be. Okay. Well, now we have farms that grow for us. Because it's expanded to that point. So you, handle it and this is really cool that, and, and I don't want to say it's cool because nobody else is doing it because I don't know how other people are doing it. But I do know that for me, like w w when I go to a farm to table uh, restaurant, I'm excited. I don't care what's on the menu. I agree. I'm like, cool, you got this down the road. I want to eat it. This is cool. I, I remember I was doing a seminar in London a couple of years ago, and uh, for we all went out to dinner after, and I had this duck. I said, this is the best. I said, and I just pulled the waiter, you know, I just said, this, I said, I just want to say something. I said, not for nothing. This is the best duck I've ever had. It, I don't know. And I said, I don't know what's, and I'll never forget this. I was like, I don't know what about this particular duck. It's so good. It's a duck breast with like good equal fat to it. And I was like, this is so good. And, you know, in her London voice or whatever, it's like, oh yeah, it was just harvested literally down the road. And I'm like, T that matters to me. And it matters to the product. Yeah. So you, so all, so right now, briefly you don't have to get into the exact details but so you have farms that you would you know basically say hey I, I need cattle from you i need we provide yes it's it's grass our beef is only grass fed uh everything else is organic uh not certified organic certified organic makes a very big difference in the price Okay. Okay. That's put that label put on that it. Right out there. Everything. Well, every you know everything is numbered. It's a very strict process to be certified organic. But the, I mean, it's not a hard process, but it makes a difference in the price. It's it's almost a difference. Like if you go to the supermarket and buy something organic or not, you know, a couple yeah. of dollars more for for half the amount. So, but. No antibiotics, no vaccines. Not even my dogs get vaccines, okay? Um, do you do titers? That's how we check, yeah. You yeah. do titer checks, especially this rabies stuff. You know, you, I know a guy who titer checked his dog for seven years and didn't have to get the shot. And what that means for people um, <laughs> who are listening, a titer is essentially taking a, a blood panel that gives you the result of what's in your dog to see if they need these vaccines or not. And so a lot of places, veterinarians and well, vets, will over-vaccinate dogs because A, it's the law in most cases, and some vets uh, will titer. So if you, if you don't want to over-vaccinate your dog, you just ask your vet if they do titering. Because that's important. I mean, that little thing that we just said, I mean, people probably don't even think of that. But you know, the only thing I want to add to that and I'm not saying it's for this reason, but I find that the cost of titer checking is five times the cost of the vaccines. Right, sure. And so people unfortunately say, forget that, just give them the vaccines. Right. But the vaccines are the reasons for so many different cancers coming out, in my opinion. Sure. I'm sure they're and correlate. I, yeah. I'm going to leave it at that. Yeah. Because that's another conversation. Mm -hmm. So, 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 so. The, the beef is grass. That's amazing, by the way, because when I go to the store, I know I'm paying a little bit extra for the grass-fed strip steak that I'm getting, but it's better. It's, it's, is it, is it grass-fed all the way through or is it finished? Grass-fed all the way through. That's, and I know a lot of farmers yeah. who sell grass-fed beef that the last four months... It's finished. They give them potato chips yeah. or anything else, they can give them to fatten them up. Yeah. You know? That's a huge yeah. difference. Our cows are smaller, but... See, that... So... And I don't know how other places are doing it, but they're—I mean, when you're doing kibble, they're—they're th they're not only th throwing in all the stuff that they're importing from China, all the the minerals and vitamins that that are in there because they say they're in there, but they're also taking in roadkill and all the, all sorts of anything stuff. else. May, maybe some people in there too. Who knows? Who knows? Got to put them somewhere. <clears throat> so, so that's amazing. And, and is that all of your protein? Chickens too. Everything is your. Everything is. Uh... No antibiotics, uh, completely natural. I've got a great a guy that does our chicken. Um, 
he's he's a phenomenal guy. He's a he's a really good guy. And I've many times, I'll tell you, listen, is this? I I make no bones about it. No pun intended. <laughs> many times, and my wife's sitting right there, I take, I'll go out to our, our slaughterhouse and I'll tell the guys, you know, give me a bag of chicken. Whatever they're making at the time that I go in there, give me a bag, I take it inside, I'm going to cook it up. And we eat it. That's the, that's the type of product it is. It's all human grade. No, no, you know, there's no leftover stuff in this food. This is, you know, you can see chunks of chicken breast, turkey breast, and and we do the best we can. You know, our, our product, it was difficult when COVID hit. Uh, the supply chains, everything was fouled up. We didn't change our product from the first time we made it. Everything is the same. We've made slight changes in we the availability of flax became difficult, so we went to chia. We replaced... Seeds. Chia, but, but the chia was more expensive. We didn't raise the price, but we went to the better. You know, they've got three different uh, levels of quality in a lot of stuff that we use in the product. Mm -hmm. uh, we, don't, we, we don't buy the, we buy the best in everything that we can buy, especially the vitamins, minerals, and, and probiotics. Um, and your probiotics is in your complete mix, right? In the complete and balanced, yes. Yeah. Because alternatively, you, you should be adding those in. Because that's one thing, like, again, same thing with We Feed Raw and, and some other companies that are out there that do a good job is you, for for your company, which, I, which I've which i used for a long time now for my dogs, yes. is it's a kind of a set it and forget it type thing. Because I think it's an overwhelming experience. So what I do for my, my food, your food, and We Feed Raw and any other company that I'm using is you get it, you thaw it out. And in your case, yours comes in big tubes, so your clients will get big tubes of raw food. And and I usually just put it in a container, put it in the fridge, and then I get my um, scale out, put my bowl on, and then I'll just pinch it off or I'll scoop it up, depending. And then they eat it twice a day. And so it's really not that hard, I guess is what I'm saying. Can I simplify that a little sure. bit? Sure. And I had this issue a few other times. It isn't that exact. You don't have to be that exact. I look at my dog all the time. Right. If, I mean, if, if you fill the bowl with the same amount every day and you get a visual on how much in that bowl it right. looks like, you can basically do it by eye. After, if, if you see that after a while your dog looks like it's a little thin, so that couple of days you give them a little bit more. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be so exact. One of my clients had all these special containers and she'd have the whole table lined up and she'd be putting this and weighing it and the scale and this and that. Doesn't have to be like that. Scoop that up, put it in there. You'll get a run on what your dog needs yeah. and what he requires. It makes it a lot simpler. I mean, people can do it your way. Don't get me wrong. You could take it right down to the morsel, but I find it not right. necessary. Right. Yeah. Yep. You just kind of look at your dog. I look see. at my dog. Yeah. He looks good. I'm happy. Yeah. Um, because it varies, right? Like uh, From dog to dog. 2.5% right. of the body weight per day is what's recommended. But uh, There's a, web a couple websites that help you. Yes, absolutely. They have for raw feeding. But I can tell you now, we've got a, a large amount of kennel dogs. That's a stressful environment. A lot of barking, a lot of jumping, always moving, moving, moving. In the wintertime... They get three pounds a day plus each, mm. okay, which is probably closer to 10% of their body weight. Yeah. So, you know, it, it, it varies from dog to dog. Yeah. I want to get into some questions. Go ahead. All right. So questions from some followers, I guess. And I'll rifle through them. So you can you can take as much time as you want. You can say yes, or you can talk five minutes on each thing. And I'm not going to go over all of them, but I'm going to go over some ones I think are, are, are good that I want to know. How's that? You got it. <laughs> raw toppings for raw topping for kibble dye. I already know that answer. It's going to be no because you don't mix, right? So raw Correct. are raw chicken eggs fresh from your own chickens okay to feed your dogs? With the shells. With the shells. Put it right in. Drop it right in. Okay. Um, and you don't have to clean the poop off. Yeah. They, they love that. Um, 
affordable things to add to cable feeders who can't afford fully raw. So let's say somebody's out there, because that is a big thing, that a lot of people, when I talk about you guys and we feed raw, and I'm like, this is, you know, they can't afford it. So what are some things that people can simply put into their raw, their kibble? That would you go ha- to the supermarket and buy chicken backs for 16 cents, 18 cents a pound. I don't know of anything that could be less expensive. Um, yeah, that's that's cheap. That's cheap. Chicken backs. Um, you want to stay away from a lot of chicken skin. So the backs, I like the backs because like, they get the bone and there's meat attached to it. Okay. Um, what what are some resources that you find for, for raw food? Like for dog nutrition? Do you have books, podcasts, uh, websites that people can go alternatively to our conversation? For raw. I'll tell you now, there's, there's a few, um, there's a few podcasts out there that I, I, uh, I've been on like, uh, Habib up in Canada, mm-hmm. um, that they get into nutritional, uh, he's very closely connected to, uh, to Marty Goldstein and they get into different discussions on, on nutritional values and, and how to best turn dogs on to raw. Um, but there's a lot, now there's a lot of information on the web. You know, you get out there, you can Google some stuff. You, could, you can give yourself tons of reading. Just do a little research. And this, is a, this, is, this question has come up a lot, and I think we've talked about it, but the, the, just the pushback from the veterinarians. Is it safe to say to just, A, don't, don't get into it to your vet because they're going to probably disagree with you? I mean, I, I would say absolutely. Well, it depends on the person. Me, I'd rather fight with the vet. <laughs> um, thoughts on HPP versus living raw food? I don't even know what that is, so... Um, that's why I asked. It. I I don't like HPP because, like I said earlier, it's like dropping your food into the washing Got it. machine. Got it. Um, how to do? do. <laughs> um, you might uh, laugh at this. Hold on one second. Yeah. I want to add something to what I just said about okay. HPP. I, I want to I want to put it in as lay a term as I can. People in the United States. Many, and I say the United States because obviously I live here. They get into it too much as far as these preventatives. HPP was done, I'm sure, to improve the quality, but it doesn't. And is the difference it makes in the food worth what they're trying to prevent? Right, and I would add, because uh, I know I had this conversation with the owner of We Feed Raw, and one of the things that they were having a really hard time with, especially with the FDA, for mass distribution, is they had to go through that process. Absolutely. It's not a choice. Right. So there is companies out there that have to go through HPP because of those reasons. And, again, it's much better to feed your dog HPP product rather than kibble. Absolutely. But – um, alternatively, to not go through that process, you'd have to find somebody like Frank, or they'd have to go out and do it. Them- they'd have to buy human food and then do it themselves. That's how you. That's how yeah. you have to do it. Human food. Yep. This is um, an interesting question. Did you have any? Sorry. Did you have any more on that? No, no, that was okay. Um, do I have to wash the raw meat before feeding the dog? Absolutely not. Do you, does she wash her own? <laughs> I don't before know. she eats it. I don't know. I don't know. It's a one-way street here. Um, so I have found it so hard finding exactly all the nutrients that needs to be sourced from the food or sor- and sourcing for the food. So if, again, if somebody's self-feeding, much like somebody we know that <laughs> who is going out there trying to, you know, put together their own raw diet, but it get, it does get overwhelming because you see the people on Instagram and TikTok and they got the sardines and they got the chicken feet and they got the turkey necks and you're like, how the, they get the rabbit feet. The alligator feet. <laughs> and some people buy the rabbit heads with the hair on it. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of different... Uh... So, so again, for somebody who's overwhelmed with, like, seeing that, and they're like, I'm going sti- to stick to this scoop. What do you... What, if you had to feed... If you had to go to Walmart... This is a good question. If you had to go to Walmart and get everything that you would need to feed your dog, what would you get? I would get... Any supermarket. I'd get turkey breast. I'd get turkey necks. 
I get probably, I would, I would source most of it from a turkey. I actually like turkey as a protein source. Okay. Uh, I find that animals digest it really well. It's got a high enough fat content that, uh, and I mean within the meat, it's got a high enough fat content to, uh, to maintain a good body weight. And so, I mean, I like our turkey product, actually. And that's probably what I should have said from the beginning. The turkey product that we make, complete and balanced, I like out of all of our products because I find that both the dogs and the cats do better on it. So as a dog owner and a cat owner, I would go with turkey, even rather than chicken. Like turkey, like a turkey breast, like a whole turkey? Um, turkey breast. Well, you gotta you gotta have the you gotta have gizzards and you gotta have the the yes you gotta have some organs you gotta have the gizzards, um, turkey heart turkey gizzards. Um, they could eat that twice a day or once absolutely a day? twice a day. Okay, absolutely. You, when you do your turkeys and your um, when you used to do your duck, did you do feather and everything or no? No, uh, and the reason we didn't is because our clients would certainly most of them would certainly run for the hills. Right. Well, but it's in the food, though. You think you'd still see it pretty good? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah. Um, um, what's your thoughts on feeding whole prey? Quail, rabbits, etc. Go for it. Cool. Um, the closer to natural you can get, the better I'm going to like it. So buying a rabbit and let it run? Go right ahead. <laughs> um, why is the risk of foodborne illness to the dog and humans who interact with it worth it? Why is it worth it? Well, I've been in this business of raw for only, let's say, 14 years. But I've been feeding raw for 25 years. That's how I had a clientele that wanted to buy it. They would see my dogs, see what I fed, and want that for theirs. And so what was the question again? Um, is, is it worth it? Like, cause is the dangers of it? Yeah. Risk or reward. Okay, so the point of the time I've been feeding, in 25 years, let's say, maybe even longer, I've never had an issue. And so after that much time doing it without an issue, human nature is you tend to get sloppy. And I'll be very specific on what I'm talking about. I was explaining earlier that we have a kennel full of dogs. Mm -hmm. I'll mix it with my hands. I let them eat it out of my hands. It splashes in my face. Everything negative that I can come up with, I've never had an issue, personally. I've never had any type of infections, any type of negative anything mm -hmm. from using raw. And so, and, and, and I've got lots of clients and they'll stand behind me and say the same thing. So if the odds are that in my favor, I don't have a problem with it. Yeah. And what about like, like for me, I have a 10 month old, he's crawling, he's mm -hmm. not walking. Mm -hmm. She'll give him a, tries to give him a bath with her tongue. Is that something that I should worry about? Is that something that other people should worry about after they? I don't believe it is. Now I'm not a doctor. I'm, I'm certainly, uh, you know, I never had a problem. I have grandchildren that were little at one time. They're not now, but, uh, my dogs always lick them in the face. Mm -hmm. uh, our cat licks us in the face. If you stand there long enough, it'll probably start eating your lips. <laughs> but you know, we doesn't. We 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 don't have a problem, and I, that's a tough one for like for me to give you a definite. Yeah. Oh, I don't worry about it. My experience has been this. Yeah. Um. Uh, I could talk all day to you, but. Well, I appreciate that. I appreciate you coming on. I, have, I, I enjoy talking to you, too. I think this is the most we've yeah. talked. It's usually pretty quick well, because if you're not in a hurry, I am. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah, there were tough, never. That's a tough life. That's why I wanted to sit down and do you this. You got me corralled. And I was just looking at the clock, and I'm like, okay. Touche. <laughs> yeah, it's 2.30 now. So um, any, do you have anything else for, and again, like this, what I like to do is 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 to is to try to educate dog owners on, not what they have to do, but what has worked for me over time and being an expert and um, it, anything other than we're going to talk about where to find you and stuff like that. But is there anything else that you would want to say to anybody out there as far as dog related? It could be anything food related. If not, that's cool, too. Well, I always have something to say. All right. All right. Uh, one thing. 
worries me with regard to raw food. Like anything else in this country, if it becomes a threat to a multi-billion dollar industry, this government is going to step in. And I know already a lot of companies have been shut down for no reason at all. And, you know, I don't, I don't want to say too much to bring hell down on myself, but it's such a contrast, such a sharp contrast to the betterment of the animal. Why would anybody want to fight it? Mm -hmm. I just, I just don't get it. It's, um, they'll start putting, the bigger it gets, the more restrictions are going to be put on it. And it's unfortunate because what happens is people go to other means and maybe not so, maybe not such good means in terms of how to get it and what to, what to feed. And I don't want to see that happen to it. It's been, it's probably the single most, the single, the single most marked improvement in, in animals in dogs at least, and cats in my lifetime. I feel really honored to be a part of, I've been in it early on, and I feel really honored to be a part of the help that so many of these animals have been given. I will show you, can you pass me my phone please? I wanna show you, and I think I could bring it up. I'm gonna show you my daughter's dog at one year old, and at nine year old, before one year old we weren't in the business. And at nine years old, we were. And I want to show you the difference in a dog nine years later. The top picture is a year old. On cable. For Same dog. Wow. Nine years later. Can I screenshot this and send Go it right to ahead. myself? Go right ahead. As long as you know how, because I don't. Yeah, I'm going to send it to myself so we can use it in the podcast. Check media. it out. And yeah. look, this is... This is my daughter. This is our dog. She runs the company now. And this is what I meant when I said, even as far as our, our kennel dogs where, you know, they're eating all this stuff. We see what it does. We see the benefits of it. And wow, it's just, it'll blow your mind. Yeah. That's a, that's a good advertisement right there. And then Frank, you're not looking right now. You're not. So it's, it's been hard for me. That's why I'm excited. It's why I've been excited to work with a company like we feed raw that will deliver you know, a raw diet to people's homes. Yes. But because, because I, I kept saying, I, I can't tell everybody to go to Frank because Frank can't we're a, take that. We're a long way off. I'm going to tell you, we've got a few things up our sleeve. We've, okay. we, we've got some things coming. I can't talk too much about right now, but I hope you have me back because when we're ready, we're, we're going to change the yeah. raw feeding in this country. I got a few things coming. I'm excited about it. And like I said, I, I could talk to you all day, but I'm mindful of, you know, your wife being very patient over there. <laughs> Team player. Thank you very much. She's great. And, and thank you for introducing. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I appreciate that. I appreciate you guys coming on. Um, anything else? I'll put all your information in the description so people can find you. Yeah, and I, I mean, right now, Roganics is not taking on new customers. We can't produce enough to fulfill our requirements. Okay. But we've got that 90% handled, and we're, gonna, we're going to be taking a, a big step. Good. And it's it's going to be cool. Awesome. Well, thanks, Frank. Appreciate it. I really enjoyed you. Cool. Thank you.